Are we live, Michelle? We're live, Terry. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Education Libraries and Lifelong Learning Cabinet Panel. It's Thursday, the 14th of October, and I bid you all welcome, whether you are joining us um, as members of the panel or indeed if you're watching from wherever you may be. Before we start the meeting formally, I have to read the following announcement with regard to COVID-19 and attendance at this meeting. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, the Council will be holding this meeting electronically. Members of the public may also attend this meeting in an electronic capacity, and there is a link on the Council's website for them to do so. Members of the Council are asked to keep their microphones switched off until called to speak and to switch their microphones off once they have finished speaking. Cameras may be left on throughout the meeting if members wish. I would mention at this point that Councillor Fiona Guest does have an issue with her camera and therefore she will not be using her camera for the meeting this morning. If you experience any connection or other technical issues, it may help to switch your camera off. Cameras should be switched on if and when speaking in the meeting. To indicate a wish to speak, members should use the raised hand function. Use of meeting chat function is exclusively for voting. At the end of the debate on each item of business, there will be a vote. Members should vote using the meeting chat function by indicating for, against or abstain. And I would ask you to use the word for because it makes it easier for people to identify the different words. And I will declare the result after each vote. Breaks of at least 15 minutes will be held every two hours and will be taken after a speaker in the debate has finished speaking. If we are voting, the vote will be conducted and concluded before the break is taken. Other breaks will be incorporated as appropriate. Now, this morning we have uh, one substitution. Fio Councillor Fiona Guest is substituting for Councillor Caroline Clapper for this meeting only. My name is Terry Duris. I'm the Cabinet Member for Education, Libraries and Lifelong Learning, and I will be chairing this meeting. And I will now go round and ask each member to very briefly introduce themselves, and starting with Christopher Alley. Hello, uh, my name is Councillor Ali. I am uh, the Conservative member on the panel representing South Foxy and Eastbury. Thank you very much. Judy? Good morning, I'm Judy Billing. I'm leader of the Labour Group and I represent Hitchin North. Thank you, Judy. Lawrence? And you're muted. You're still muted, Lawrence. Am I muted now? No, you're OK now. OK, I'm Lawrence Brass. I'm the Liberal Democrat member for Bushy North. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Fiona, Fiona Guest. I'm Fiona Guest, Conservative member for Hemel Hempstead North West, and I'm substituting on this panel. Fiona Hill. I'm Fiona Hill, Conservative County Councillor for Royston Eastern and Ermine Division and Vice Chairman of this ca Cabinet panel. Thank you very much. Paula Hiscox. Paula. Good morning, everybody. I'm Paula Hiscox. I'm the Conservative member for Rickmansworth West. Chris. I'm uh, Chris Lloyd, the Liberal Democrat member for Croxley Green, and I'm delighted that my boundaries border both Paula and Councillor Watkin. <laughs> Jen. Hi, I'm Jen Madden. Uh, Independent councillor, Hemel Hempstead, South East. Thank you. Mark? Uh, Mark Mills Bishop, Conservative member for Frampstead End and Turnford. Thank you. Michael? Uh, uh, Michael Muir, uh, Conservative uh, member uh, for Bordock and uh, a little bit of lecturers. Thank you, Michael. Mark Watkin? 
Thank you, Terry. Um, it's good to be last. I can prepare my speech. Um, I'm Mark Watkin. I'm the opposition. I was in Lib Dem spokesperson for education and children's services. And my uh, division is Nascot Park in Watford. And it's bordered by several people. So I won't bother to list you here. OK. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we have no apologies other than uh, Caroline Clapper, who is being substituted by uh, Fiona Guest. Um, if any member has any disclosable, pecuniary or declarable interests, would you please let us know those before the start of that particular item to which it refers? Um, I'm now going to invite members to agree the part one minutes of the Education Libraries and Li Lifelong Learning panel held on the 2nd of September. Um, and if I could ask you to agree those via the chat button for a Chairman. Yeah. I've asked if I could speak on that before we do that. I'm I'm not in a position to agree them at this moment. Okay. Um, I wasn't aware that you wanted to. So. Um, well, I put my hand up. That's all I can do, really. Oh, um, is it is it for accuracy? Well, sort of, yes. Because that's what we're agreeing the minutes for accuracy. OK, well, well, let me tell you what my problem is and you can tell me how to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, go on. OK, my problem is um, minute 210, um, which is about Hexton School. And we were assured that the views of the panel would be shared with Cabinet. And um, from what I can understand, the um, very strong views of the panel were not shared with Cabinet. And I'm not quite, I mean, Mark's looking pained at my taking this approach already, but I'm not exactly sure how to deal with it uh, because it's a matter of huge upset to those of us who are trying to support Exton School. OK, well, I I believe that I did. Um, I, if, if, I, if I didn't in the, as, as much as you might have wanted me to, um, I can't rewrite history in point of fact, but I did actually seek to reflect um, the essence, and I think that was the word that I used, the essence of the uh, discussion that took place at the panel meeting uh, uh, following the petition. But of course, it was the previous decision that actually took the um, the item to cabinet. But I did, I believe, reflect though the essence of that. And I, I did listen back again to it. And I felt that what I had said did reflect the, the essence of it. So okay, fact, I, it, it, yeah. but, we, but with respect, Judy, we are um, there. There will be, I think, not today, uh, but there will be opportunities going forward to discuss Hexton again. Um, quite clearly, and I, I would suggest probably that you might want to bring that point up um, when we next discuss Hexton at a future panel meeting. But I think really we're just discussing and seeking the agreement of the minutes of the meeting as an accurate record of the me meeting. OK, and you will understand that I will try every possible opportunity um, to help Hexton School, and this is just one of them. Thank you very much, Terry. I, I absolutely understand that and yeah. respect your position. And of course, I do. Thank you. Um, on that basis, can we um, agree the minutes of that meeting on the 2nd of September, please? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, that has been agreed and we note one abstention. Let's move now to the next. Uh, there are no public petitions today um, and 
let's now move to item three, our way forward, the plan for children and young people. Now, I know that Joe Fisher is presenting this. Ah, and I am aware that Joe may have an issue with her connection. Um, if it's any consolation to you, Joe, um, it would appear that all the three, the, the, the three telephone signals fall, fell over earlier on today, which uh, caused a minor panic in, in, in my small household. But uh, welcome. And uh, would you like to introduce this particular item, please? I should say before you do. Um, that this item is coming to this panel, um, but it is also coming to the uh, and will be presented at the Children, Young Peoples and Families panel on the 11th of November. And I think it's probably fair to say that the bulk of this um, plan revolves around that area as well as, but in the majority of that area, but includes education, which is why it's here today. And I suspect um, looking looking at Judy, I think she will have some questions for you on it anyway, which is fine. But please do introduce it. Thank you, Chair. And by way of an apology, just to confirm, there are two things happening. One is that the roadmen outside my house have said that my connection may come down at quarter past ten. I've got an eye on the clock. If it does, Chair, and I drop out, I'm told it will last for five minutes. Um, I am really sorry. I don't think there's anything I can do about that. So sorry if I do drop out, I will return. Um, second. You've gone so muted, what? Joe. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So did you hear me saying that I might drop out yes. a quarter past ten? Se secondly, due to the connection problems I'm having this morning, um, I, I'm struggling to share any presentations. So, Chair, I'm just going to talk to you about the key points rather than share the presentation. So I do apologise. Um, I hadn't anticipated the roadworks that appeared on my road this morning. So um, just moving forward, I'm Jo Fisher. I'm, I'm the Director of Children's Services. Um, thank you for having me and thank you for your welcome. Um, so you've got in front of you the paperwork to do with our way forward, our, our plan for children and young people, um, and, and really thinking about how we drive up and continue to get the best outcomes for children and young people and support them to get their lives back on track and their education back on track following the pandemic. Um, you'll have noted that the plan was put together following significant consultation with a broad range of stakeholders um, from young people, schools, families um, and professionals across the sector. Um, and we set out a five year plan um, for our, setting out our ambitions for children and young people. We will update that plan annually. So we have built into the plan a set of strategic priorities that we will um, hold ourselves to account for and review on an annual basis to make sure that we make a real and meaningful contribution to improving outcomes for children and young people. And a second point to draw your attention to is that we believe it's got a really strong golden thread throughout it, both to our children, um, children's uh, outcome bees. So you, you, members will be familiar with our, our aspirations to make sure that children are safe, they're healthy, they have high aspirations, they achieve in life and that they are included in life. But also with the broader um, council uh, priorities around um, making sure that we drive forward the um, collaboration between health and social care, but also that sustainable growth and a sustainable environment um, runs through all of our key priorities. Now, you all have noted within the plan that there are five main ambitions. Um, and I, I'm not going to go too, through, through too much detail, but I do want to just draw your attention to some of them that I believe are really important. Um, and they're designed both to embed that golden thread, but most importantly, address some of the key challenges and opportunities that we see for children um, in the next five years. Um, so, so firstly, we know that as a result of the pandemic, we've seen um, an ongoing increase in referrals, both to our children's services, um, front door and social care, but also um, to, we've seen increasing numbers of children um, in care within Hertfordshire. Um, a, a real central plank of our, our strategy is making sure that we've got the right provision for those children most in need 
in Hertfordshire, so within our county boundaries. So we're really pressing um, ahead with uh, driving up sufficiency of children in care placements in Hertfordshire. And Chair, I, I, I do apologise. I think someone's about to knock on my door and tell me they're taking down the systems. They're waving at me. Can you? Can I come back to you in two seconds and just see if I can negotiate a few more minutes? If If you could, yeah. Yeah, two seconds. Apologies, Chair. I have bought. I have bought fifteen minutes. I do apologise for that. They've been very understanding. Okay, right. I'm, I'm case, really sorry. They, they, do, it's, it's what on earth phone. did you pay? <laughs> I, I, I just asked very nicely if they okay. could allow it. Um, Chair, can I suggest that we've only got 15 minutes before Joe's goes, so she doesn't spend too long on the presentation and opens it up to general discussion? Yeah, uh, Mark, I was actually just going to just, I was just going to say that. So I think actually, do you just want to spend one more minute? Okay, okay. And, and then we'll I'll wrap it up really quickly. I'll assume you've all read the paper and I'm happy yeah. to take your questions. So right. you know that I've set out five key ambitions, Chair, across it. So one is about making sure we've got the right provision locally. Um, both children and care placements, really thinking about how we create more placements in Hertfordshire, um, both in terms of our residential settings, but also our foster care settings for those most in need. But also thinking about our school placements, and I would highlight our special school place strategy as a key part of that, making sure that we've got the right places to educate our children, including our most vulnerable children within Hertfordshire. Another key plank of our, 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 our strategy is making sure that we've addressed the diversity of needs um, through tailoring our services. And again, um, within this particular uh, group, I would highlight the, the SEND transformation programme and our, our SEND strategy to make sure that we're really thinking through how we meet the children, the needs of children with SEND within Hertfordshire. Um, alongside that, you'll have seen that we flag the, um, the need to make sure that we've got our education back on track and we're working really closely with Hearts for Learning, both to think about how we drive up sort of educational outcomes for children and young people, but embedded throughout our back on track programme is also thinking about the emotional well-being and resilience of children and young people. And there's a significant amount of work happening across all of our schools and with our pupils around pupil well-being, both through our education psychology service, through our safe space counselling service, but also through our mental health leads within schools. So it's right up there. And it really is about balancing the need to make sure that we're thinking about the academic, but also the broader well-being of our children as we move out of the pandemic. Jo, and lastly, just, I would Jo, like the importance... I'm just going to stop you there. Let me take some very, yeah, very sure. short questions, please. But do please keep the questions really brief. Mark Watkin. Mark Watkin. Sorry, Chair, I was happy to think I was going to be first in line, so I, <laughs> you caught me go, saying... Go. Um, Joe, I, look, the document is absolutely fine in principle, of course it is. Who would argue against what you're trying to achieve? Except, um, in the back of my mind, is it's 2026 that you have to achieve what you're setting out to achieve. And I think particularly about school placements for children with special needs and... Uh, and what else? I mean, I've got to be careful because I would stray off into ascend. Obviously, there's a huge pressure there. But but also, uh, you know, I'm just trying to keep it to education. Um, and I think the, the making sure so school placements and also closing the gap. Closing the gap is going to be a huge, huge challenge. And we're not able to control all the all the variable inputs. You know, the, the, the bats will do their own thing and we have to try and force them to do that. So what I'm really saying is two things. One, 
can you honestly say, and I don't mean to be, that sounds unfortunate, can you be confident that you will achieve what you say about school places, particularly for children with special needs, particularly when you look at the way education and healthcare plans are going northwards at a massive rate? And secondly, how will we be able to measure annually, you're going to report back whether you're on track or not? So I will want to take close interest on the criteria, the parameters you put up in front of us to illustrate that you're actually going to achieve what you said you want to achieve in 2026. So that's a thought for the future. But the but okay. narrowing the gap and Mark. school placements are the key one to me. Mark, I, I I don't wish to impose, but bearing in mind Joe's time constraints, I can, I ask, can I ask people to pose the question only and wait until <laughs> after Joe has left to make any supporting statements? So I'm going to come to Judy next, please. Thank you, Chair. And my question is, loving the words, loving that we're committed to hearing, listening and responding to the voices of children and families. But I am sinking under a sea of casework to do with, send provision to do with, um, in-year admission. You're muted. What do we do about the children who seem to sink in the cracks all the time? However fine our words and fine our intentions, there are cracks everywhere. OK, thank you, Judy. Uh, let me take the question from Mark Mills Bishop and then I'll ask Joe to come back and respond. Yeah, Terry, very quickly, um, uh, no question, uh, but I ought to make a declarable interest, uh, which I can make after uh, yeah, Joe. Yeah, do, do it afterwards. I don't want, I don't want to lose um, Joe's time. No. Yeah, okay. uh, I've got one other hand who I can't see at the moment. Uh, who is it? Who is it? Somebody's got Fiona. their hand up. Fiona. See, Terry. Yeah, Fiona guest question. Thank you. Do you want to take Mark first as he was in line before on the No, he's done. He's done. He, he, he's not <laughs> asking a question. Carry on, Fiona. Well, it's on page four. Let's see. Item 4.1 says the staff that have been consulted with, does that include teachers? I see young people okay. are being consulted with. So how are the young people selected to, to be consulted? OK, there you go. Joe, some questions for you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer the questions fully um, and uh, just just assume that we've got got the time to, to address them. So, so, so one, the first question, um, Mark, thank you, about special school places and our confidence around that. Um, you'll know that our special school place strategy was based on a really in-depth sort of analysis, both of the needs of children um, with education healthcare plans and SEND in Cross Hertfordshire, but also the types of school places they'll need moving forward. Um, and we also built into that some of the sort of demographic data that we've got for Hertfordshire. Um, based on that, we've our, our special school place strategy anticipates that we need over 300 new places, as you, you say, by 25-26. Um, we are uh, working really hard to implement those plans. You'll know from previous discussions that, for example, our progress for specialist resource places across four of our secondary schools. Are, uh, those plans are going ahead and are on track. Um, and we're now thinking, um, well, we, we're now consulting around how we broaden that out across the primary school sector. So again, I'm confident that that work is progressing at pace and on track. We have plans for um, additional schools in different parts of the county. And again, those plans are on track. So the council has put a huge amount of capital funding behind this, as well as a huge amount of sort of staff time and resources to make sure that we're progressing this as fast as we can. Um, so, yes, you know, I'm, I'm confident that the, the special school place strategy is based on, you know, a good, a good look at what, what is needed as we move into the future. And we've done our best to future proof it. Um, and I'm confident that the current work that we've got in hand is progressing. Um, in the, so, so I hope that answers your, your first question. Um, your second question, Mark, which was around 
how do we hold ourselves to account for some of the sort of you know measures of success that we've built into the broader children's services plan so what i was saying to you is that we're going to be refreshing we're, we're going to be report a we'll be reporting on how we're we're achieving those uh measures of success and we'll be reporting on those on a regular basis back to children and young people's panel and indeed to this panel for the for those um as well so um and it may well be that we need to think with you and with the, with the chair around which particular measures of success this panel is interested in and making sure that we're bringing back um, reports on that on a regular basis and I, I think that's probably a you know a good way forward um, and we will be refreshing our ambitions on an annual basis of our annual priorities um, so whilst it's a five-year plan we don't anticipate that it will be a static plan we anticipate that it will be an agile plan and actually as we achieve our annual ambitions um, we'll, we'll move um, through new ones um, within the broader five-year strategic vision for children and young people. So there's a very strong um, process in place to make sure that we held ourselves to account. Um, and secondly, um, the next question, which was from Judy, which was around um, the cracks in the system and how are we going to address those. Judy, apologies, because I think certainly on my um, laptop. You cut out for quite some time during that question, but I think I'm right in what you were asking. Was it, was it specifically around SEND? Can I just ask for some clarification? Because I think you were, so I couldn't hear the whole question. Sorry, it was uh, at the moment I'm sinking under SEND and in-year admissions dating back yeah. to June yeah. where nothing's yeah. happening and it's yeah. just driving me insane and driving the people I'm trying to represent even more insane yeah okay so so on the in-year admissions and 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 presumably is that specifically just so I'm clear you're asking specifically in relation to SEND or just broader in year in broader uh, in year admissions yeah yeah well, um, yeah, so, but there's always a tinge, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know the specifics of, 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 of your question. What I would say is what the strategy does do is build in very clearly a vision that we've got the right sufficiency for our children and young people in terms of educational places and special schools, which should um, make sure that we are addressing the in-year admission issue. Um, and, and with the SEND, our SEND strategy moving forward and i think i'm pretty confident that we've brought that send strategy here for this panel to review what that strategy puts in place is a really clear plan around how we continue to drive forward our vision for children with send and our ambition to get it right for them um, and within that there's some really concrete proposals around strengthening our frontline teams to make sure that we are um building relationships with families and schools and others that are based on um, recognition of strengths and based on very clear and frequent communication so we've got a we've we've got a plan for addressing some of those issues that are probably filling your inbox at the moment judy but we're also really driving forward the early intervention piece for children with send so how do we begin to make sure that they get the right support at the right time before problems escalate and before um, ch ch parents and schools um, begin to feel that they need to write um, into the council. Now, um, we recognise that there's a need for a sort of culture and behaviour change, as well as the need for ongoing investment into the SEND world. Um, and again, that is embedded in our SEND strategy as we move forward. So I would anticipate over the next 12 months that you begin to see um, some very clear um, markers of improvement and success as we as we begin to address some of what, what are really huge and systemic issues across the SEND system, Judy. Um, it's a whole it's a whole system issue and there's no simple fix what it does mean is that we need to have a sort of collective vision for children with SEND that is shared across health across social care and across education and that is right at the forefront of our SEND strategy as we move forward and the council is continuing to invest in that strategy to make sure that we get it right
Joe, um, I think that we're probably about to lose you. So I, what I'm going to do is continue with the the general discussion. Um, do stay on the line and then when you're reconnected, come back and we'll. Yeah, we I, I haven't, you haven't lost me yet. So if I stay here and then if I drop out, I, I drop out. Is that OK, Chair? Um, yeah, I'll stay fine. here for as long as I can and answer the questions. Yeah, um, there was the, fir th the third uh, question from Fiona Guest about um, interaction with um, people, um, young people, teachers, staff, etc. So the consultation that was was undertaken um, for for this strategy. Um, uh, unfortunately, Hannah, who who undertook that consultation, wasn't able to make it today. Um, but I, I can tell you that we went out um, through um, a number of different mechanisms, surveys, but also focus groups, making sure that we pulled together a whole range of people. I need to come back to you about how we consulted with young people because I don't have that at my fingertips, Fiona. Um, so I don't want to hypothesize here. Um, I'd much rather come back to you with a factual response on that. But I do know that there was a really wide ranging consultation sitting behind this, this strategy. And indeed the feedback that we're getting is that this strategy really is um, an important one for, for rising to some of the really important challenges we anticipate we'll see over the next five years. Um, so I think there's a sort of, you know, we've had positive feedback about our draft strategy. We've had uh, a lot of positive affirmation that we're going in the right direction with it. OK, thanks, Joe. Uh, Mark, let's come to Mark Mills Bishop. Um, you wanted to declare an interest, I think. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I should make a, um, uh, a declarable interest uh, as shown in the register of my wife and son, who are teachers in the, in the county. And also I am vice chairman of the Children, Young People and Families panel, in which this paper will be coming uh, on the 11th of November. Uh, but I'm hugely supportive and appreciative of the work that Joe has done, um, and I will be supporting the paper. Thank Thanks you, Chair. Thank you, Mark. And of course, within the recommendation, although we're uh, talking about recommending adoption to the cabinet uh, in conjunction with the Children and Young Peoples and Families panel, we are um, hugely supportive, as you say, and adding our support to that. Uh, Paula, Paula Hiscox. Yeah, Paula, uh, Joe's just had to leave. Just yes. you know. Yep, yep, oh. yep, noticed. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Pushing all my buttons to make me be seen and heard. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, really good paper. I'm really glad it's coming annually and it's going to feed back in regularly to both panels. Um, one area which I am always concerned about is early years and vulnerable children who don't access education, absenteeism, not through any fault of their own, but through through families. And I'm really glad to see that at number five, there seems to be a lot of work uh, looking at early signs of neglect and um, reducing the risk to these children. So an excellent report. And it's actually looking at some areas which I do have a lot of concerns about. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paula. Uh, uh, the early years, actually, it falls within uh, uh, Theresa Heritage's portfolio in that context. But one of the things that we do have is um, the virtual school um, for children looked after, which has done and, and can you, continues to do some great work in supporting those people who have come from uh, really difficult and, and troubled beginnings. Uh, the other thing also, just to, if I may make a couple of brief comments, one is um, this is all allied to the school improvement strategy, which we previously discussed, um, which has, has uh, now reached its um, activity area. Um, and the other thing as well is that this is not, as Joe said, and I think possibly one of our colleagues said, goodness me, Joe's back already. Well done. Um, I, that was obviously a quick cup of tea for the, your 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 contractors. Um, but also, this is not a document for sitting on the shelf. It is a document that's going to be refreshed and renewed and revisited almost on a constant basis, but certainly um, reviewed on an annual basis and, and looked at. So it's it's a very much a living document. Um, and of course, that that without wishing to sound too twee about it, is the fact that all the young people 
you know, they, they are growing, they're maturing, they're changing, and we have to adapt to the circumstances that prevail at the time. So, uh, Paula, um, unless you've got another question, no, uh, would you fine. like to take your hand down, please? I thought I had. Oh, well, you have now. It's fine. Yeah, sorry, it's probably a bit no, late. No, 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 it's fine. Um, it's obviously this is all all the whole meeting is going through Joe Fisher's uh, new electronic wire, which is why it's being delayed. Everything goes through Joe Fisher's road. Um, Chris Lloyd. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Joe. I need to probably start by declaring, as Mark did, um, an interest. I'm the Hearts County Council representative on little green school can you hear me yes we can yeah, yeah. that's fine um and my wife works for two hours as a school librarian so i've declared that interest i can now give my support so i think it, it is actually very key I and mean, obviously within the vision we're talking about being happy loved and thriving and it's been an incredibly challenging time for parents and for children with with covid um, but what i'd like to touch on is a question and it is a challenge because of the age of our school buildings um, of two sa sustainability ones one is uh, obviously the challenge that you know that's where our problem is with our school buildings but from having experienced the and I can take this with you separately Terry um, the challenge of um, getting answers on questions to getting solar panels on the roof uh, that is a definite challenge uh, the other challenge is I think parents walk to school for a day or for a week uh, with their children, we actually need to work together with you to try and make a, you know, a major change rather than people just doing it as a as a one off for a week or for a day looking at, you know, walk to school, clean air day. We've obviously done something recently and this is something all of us need to work together in to encourage people to do more of that. So thank you, Terry. OK, thank you very much indeed, Chris. Uh, in terms of um solar panels on 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 roofs um i do know that we i think we we gained about 13 million pounds on the salix bid last year um which allowed a number of schools to actually be improved um either with uh, heat source pumps or new window walling and and uh, solar panels on on the roofs and it's that that salix bidding opportunity is something and i can't give you the detail of it but all like what i can say is that it is something that we are very alert to and whenever there are any opportunities to bid for funding for these things then we do whether or not we always get them is another matter but we do bid and we are alert to it um mark mark Watkin. Thank you very much, Chairs. I did want to come back. Sorry to have a second shot. I know Fiona is right. waiting to speak. Um, the one area I should have mentioned is those uh, children who are uh, electively home educated, mm -hmm. nicely put, but we all know they represent a major challenge. And, and really, I, I don't know whether it ties into the SEND and school place planning or not, but I think we need to look very closely at what is happening to those children who are not officially being educated under the system. And I don't know if that's really picked up in the document, but uh, uh, it's more of a comment than it, it needs a question on that. But I think it's something I just wanted to put on on, on record. Um, um, Mark, you're, you're, you're being um, um, very, very, um, what's the word? Very, very astute here because you mention it, but I, I know that you know um, that you have submitted a written question on that very topic. Um, and I have actually already seen the draft response, which sets out in significant detail the data, um, which will be coming to you as part of the response. Uh, okay. I may just respond, Terry. Yeah. The reason I've raised it is that will give us the current state of play. But I'm looking forwards. We really want to make sure the only children who are home educated are those who are done for positive reasons by families who have the ability to do it, not those who feel the education system doesn't provide them with the service that they need. That's really the point I'm trying to get out there. Yeah, I mean, without wishing to sort of enter into a a one-on-one a -on -one debate, Mark, um, the, I think that one of the issues is that there is nothing to stop a parent home educating a child. Um, and 
we may not feel that it is the most appropriate thing. We feel, I'm, I'm sure I speak for everybody, that the better, the better place for a child to be educated is in a school. But there's a significant number of people who don't subscribe to that for a whole range of reasons. And I think you'll see the, the reasons when you see the response to your written request or your written uh, question. But it's something that um, we can always come back and discuss because um, elective home education is 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 a hot topic. Um, so I, I think just wait wait until next week when you get the answer, and then maybe we'll come back again on it. Uh, Fiona Hill. Thank you, Terry. Um, Thank you, Joe, as well. I'm delighted to see this document. Um, as, as has been mentioned by others, I, I've had a record number of concerns this year regarding SEND, and it's hugely worrying for the families concerned and what the outcomes will be. So really glad to hear you recognise these points. And also the early years. Again, we all know that it's proven that early intervention helps prevent issues and stack up problems in the future. So I think it's a great document. Really pleased to see it. Also, the fact it won't just be sitting there, but it'll be a working document over the years. And thank you for recognising the issues that I know we're all seeing at the moment. Yeah, it. it uh... We are in, it would be fair to say, we are in challenging times um, and we, we support Jo and her team and we and we mustn't forget the work that her team does and, and, and sometimes um, they they are almost perhaps overwhelmed by the, the pressures um, and they, but they work incredibly hard to try and resolve them. Um, there will always be some people who will consider that perhaps they haven't been ha dealt with as much as uh, or as well as they would have liked to have been but um that that probably is always going to be the case but uh, coming back to the uh, plan for children and young people um this is as i've said before such an important document it sets it out um i think there will be a lot more to be said about it at teresa heritage's panel um on the 11th of november um and of course it's open to anybody to to sit in and watch and 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 I I can't speak for Teresa but um, in my way if there are other members who wish to speak and contribute at a panel I will always give respect to those members. So on that basis I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, I need just to go to the chat function um, and I've got a message I think. Right, OK. Um, not quite sure what uh, Stephanie has indicated about that, but we do need to vote on this, please. So uh, the, the recommendation, it's a short one. Sometimes I read the short ones. I don't always read the long ones. Um, that the Education Library's Lifelong Learning Cabinet Panel note and comment upon the content of our way forward and the strategic priorities and recommend adoption of them to Cabinet. So for, against or abstain, please. Thank you very much indeed. That has been agreed. Thank you very much. Um, I wish you well for the rest of your day, Joe. You're Thank more you. than welcome to stay. And uh, I mean, clearly you won't have any other contact with the outside world. So stay in. <laughs> but thank you and have a good day. Thank you very much, Chair. And apologies for the disruption. No, no, it, I think uh, it was it was seamless. Brilliant. Um,
Right, let us move now, please, to item four, and we welcome Jane Avery. Uh, this is the Hertfordshire County Council admission arrangements for 2023 and 2024. Um, a number of items here um, which Jane will take you through um, and we will I think we'll just sort of if perhaps just take them one by one Jane because some of them are slightly complex particularly I think the first one so we'll take the first one then um, invite any questions and then we'll go to the, the next the next couple okay that's fine so, Jane do you want to introduce the um, the, the definition of home home address, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to provide a little bit of background and context before going to that proposal. This is uh, proposals for the for the annual admissions consultation. Uh, the County Council as the admitting authority for Hertfordshire's community and voluntary controlled schools is required to consult publicly for six weeks uh, prior to any amendment to um, admission arrangements. Um, and that consultation has to be uh, between the 1st of October and the 31st of January. Um, we have one proposal this uh, this year for the 23-24 academic year, which will impact upon all community and voluntary controlled schools. And that's an amendment to the uh, definition and methodology of determining determining a child's permanent home address uh, when we get disputed applications. It's a relatively small number of applications each year. Um, we have around uh, 15,000 primary applications, around 15,000 secondary applications and eight to 10,000 um, in-year applications. And this um, amendment will probably um, touch on less than less certainly less than 20 every, every academic year so it's a very small number however every year we do get um, dual applications and they're generally from families um, going through um, a parental dispute or split up or um, in different households and where the child or children involved live with both parents and the issues we get is we have applications potentially from both mum and dad with uh, different addresses and sometimes different schools ranked. And this can lead to a very long drawn out and difficult communication issue with parents, with officers trying to establish that permanent home address. We've had legal advice um, advising that the use of child benefit as an underlying dis decider um, is challengeable. And our legal advice is actually what we need. What we should really be doing is going back to those parents who are in dispute to say you need to come together to submit a joint application. Um, and if you're unable to do that, you need to go back to court, basically, so that family court can make that decision. So i.e. the legal advice is it's a court decision. It's not a local authority or officer decision. And that's fundamentally what we're changing our definition to explain and to ensure that parents are transparent and clear on that issue. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so it, as to paraphrase it, we, as you say, we are we're putting the decision in the hands of the court rather than us um, acting as trying to act as an intermediary, which is not the right thing for us to be doing. Um, I've got Mark Watkin, who is indicating. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Jane. Um, yes, I, it sounds eminently sensible that a decision of that complexity and sensitivity should not be passed to officers to try and administer uh, an absolute minefield that uh, is only ever going to hand up in grief and hard, you know, and unpleasantness. I just wanted to clarify something in uh, 4.6. Um, where you say where a family has not lived at an address for a year, they must be able to demonstrate that they own the property or have a tenancy agreement for a minimum of 12 months and the child must be resident. Um, the, the, the substance of my question is this. Um, it's more hearsay and repute that people have been said to have moved into properties near oversubscribed schools for the convenience of having a local address. Once their child is in, they relocate to their mansion four miles away, having got into the outstanding school. Does that 
item cover that? Is that part of what that's about? Uh, and it, I mean, I don't know. It's 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 sort of you know a street gate um, com, sort of conversation type comment. I've got no evidence to confirm or deny that it happens, but it wouldn't surprise me if it happened. I'd be interested to get your comments. Can that, I just before before Jane comes back in, Mark? In this is something that has. It's an allegation that has been made for as long as I can remember, certainly for the last 20 years. Um, very often when when actually confronted with it, uh, you hear from a state agent saying, oh, yes, we know all about this. But when, when you actually ask them, they say, oh, well, it, it's just what we heard. But having said that, I am also aware that where there have been some fraudulent um, applications made, we have actually taken uh, very stringent action against those and and uh, deleted all their applications and and put them to the very bottom of the list but um that's it's not meant to be a, a, a tangential comment but uh, jane would you like to pick up mark's one thank you terry i think firstly mark for clarification that part of the definition is unchanged so that exists in our current arrangements and we also have almost a page in our definitions about what we will do if we think an application is fraudulent every year we have um, a number of allegations about people using fraudulent addresses usually with our most popular primary and secondary schools and so we work very closely with schools, whether they're um, their own admitting authority or, or, or a community school, uh, to ensure that if parents have used a, a fraudulent or misleading address, we will find that out and ensure that no child is disadvantaged. Um, and every year after we allocate, we will go out um, to hundreds of parents, basically asking them to prove their address. Those are parents that have been allocated on the basis of distance, because obviously a parent allocated with a sibling their actually address is, is irrelevant. So we work very closely with um, our most popular schools to ensure that uh, addresses are, are appropriate and relevant. And as Terry has said, if we don't think they are, we will withdraw that place. Mark? You're, you're muted again, Mark. Mark, you're muted. But I'm, I got my right. So <laughs> um, to start again. Um, if a child has started in a school, and bearing in mind the child is innocent, it's the parent who are guilty of this crime, and it's just a crime, I think. It's only a civil act. Um, does the child's place then get removed? What is the and because obviously another child who should have had the place has been denied that place. So how do you? I know this isn't specific to the issue that you're putting in front of us, but if you could give us two two seconds of your time, I'd be really grateful to understand that. Absolutely. First of all, and um, going it round the other way, if we believed an, uh, uh, an application had been made fraudulently, we would withdraw that place and allocate the child we believe had been disadvantaged at yeah. that time. So that yeah. other child is already in. If um, the child, if the, the fraudulent child, shall we say, has started school, we have previously, very rarely, um, but we have previously withdrawn that place. Um, I can remember one particular case that actually did go to the High Court and our actions were sustained by the High Court in that particular um, incident. And that was around um, an application to one of our very popular Harpenden secondary schools. So we can and legally do take places away. It's very rare. Um, yeah. And we'd, we'd have that discussion with the school as well. So we don't have a carte blanche approach. We'd have a we'd have an individual approach. That's helpful. Thank you very much. I've taken too much of your time, but it's been very helpful. And and Mark, I think you you made a very good point at the at the start of your your question, which is that that the child is the innocent victim of this, um, and which is very true. Lawrence Lawrence Brass. Thank you, Chairman. This is this is really on the same matter. Um, I think that this is a, a quite a widespread uh, problem, um, despite what people are saying. Now, you've said, uh, Jane, that you seek to prove the addresses. I, I'm just wanting to know, do you physically attend the houses of the applicants' parents? We have, yes, absolutely. Obviously not the 40,000 applicants that we get, but um, in the cases of the uh, the individual disputes, if we're hearing one story from the playground and from the school and from the allegations being made, 
we've had evidence from the parents and it just doesn't tie together, we can and do go and ring on doorbells before breakfast. Right, so this would be your department, not the school itself? This would be our department, yes. OK, but I mean, I've, I've had stories in in London, certainly at popular schools where there have been a knock on the door at nine o'clock at night and parents have answered the door just checking that you are Mr. And Mrs. Smith and you genuinely live here because people are using temporary accommodation to get favourable responses yeah. for applications. Yeah, that's I, I, I can't say that that doesn't happen. Um, certainly, we I don't think we'd go knocking in in the evening, but it could be a school if that school is an omitting authority, and fundamentally the decision is theirs about whether to accept that address or not. A lot of work is undertaken, and yes, we will. When a case is pushed to that nth degree, and we feel we do need some validation or not, we will pay off a personal visit, and we make that clear in our definitions as well. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, Jan, I, I, we, I think we've slightly strayed away from the actual recommendation, uh, but Jan. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Yes, I might be straying away a little bit as well. Um, just just to sort of reinforce what Jane was saying, really, um, this happened to me in my previous time as county councillor years ago, um, and the child had been um, the, the, the fraudulent application child had been in the school for uh, half a term um, and I'd, I'd just like to praise the department on the way that it was dealt with because they 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 did find a place for the child that was displaced because of it, it within that school setting but didn't take the child away because it wasn't the child's fault that was the that was the what, what I was told it wasn't the child's fault that their parents had put in a fraudulent application but the the parents certainly did get very severely reprimanded. So I just wanted to add that and praise the, the department for their actions on that one. Thank you, Jack. Okay. Uh, Chris Lloyd. Right. I have a question for you first, Terry, and then one for Jane. So my question for you is, are we voting on each of these changes separately or are no. we voting on the whole lot at the end? We will vote on the whole lot at the end. OK, that's for client. And J Jane, um, my question for you is, and I'm fully supporting the change, so I will try and keep to the point, is over the years, how many of these examples have we had roughly? Which is why we need this change. I would say, best guess, I haven't got exact stats, um, where we have the real dispute less than 10 a year. OK, no, that's fine. I'm happy, Terry, to say that we've had enough information that I'd be happy to move us on to the next point because I think Jane has covered all the points and we should be supporting this first change. Good. Um, right. OK, the next one, there's two elements to it. One is the oversubscription criteria for the Purton Primary School and the other one is to reduce the published admission numbers for a number of schools. Um, all the local members have been um, advised of this and in just in relation to Purton Primary School, I am going to ask you to keep your um, comments purely to the matter in hand, which is the oversubscription for Purton Primary School. And insofar as it uh, reflects on Hexton to simply say that we are in the middle of a consultation uh, process with Hexton. So please let us stick to the item on the agenda paper, please. So Jane, do you want to, and Judy is already getting her boxing gloves out. Um, do, do you want, can you introduce this one for me, please, Jane? Thank you, Terry. Yes. Um, this this um, proposal to um, amend the oversubscription criteria for Purton is obviously directly linked to the proposal currently out of consultation to close Hexton Primary School. Um, and I can't explain one without without the other. Purton is the nearest community primary school to the parish of Hexton. If Hexton School closes, what we would like to do as offices is to try and ensure that those children in those parish can access um, their next nearest school. We have therefore discussed with Purton um, and are proposing to amend Purton's admission arrangements so children from Hexton in the future, 
if Hexton School closes, will be given a higher priority for, entrant, for entry to Purton School. And that means they'll be given priority immediately after children for whom Purton is the nearest. Yeah. That's do you, fundamentally do you, the do you proposal. Want to, do you want to just go on to the next one with regards to the Reduction in uh, the pans yeah. at the five community schools, please. Yes, I will. Um, we have five community schools uh, spread across the county, um, where we're where we're proposing to reduce um, the pan by by a form of entry in each school, um, and those schools are uh, Brookland Infant School in uh, Chesant, Hollywell JMI in Watford, the Lays Primary and Nursery School in Stevenage. Oakmere Primary School in Potters Bar and Longmeadow Primary in Stevenage. Um, so five schools in individual communities, each with the same proposal to reduce the school's intake into reception. And that's directly related to a decrease in demand for reception places across those areas. In every case, it's in agreement with the head teacher and governing body. And it's to try and help going forward um, to ensure that those those schools are financially sustainable um, and that they can have a sensible class organisation. Kate Leahy is here for any detailed questions about those pan reductions or planning across those areas. Thank you, thank you Jane and uh, we will it's good to know that Kate is here as well um, and I think the point that you make about the the reduction in the published admission numbers at those five schools is very important because it does, and I can only reiterate, it it helps with the financial planning and indeed the class planning in those schools, um, because there is nothing worse than if you've got a pan uh, which is 60 and you finish up with say 35 or 37 children, it makes it incredibly difficult to manage that school on by the, the, the governing body um, and the head teacher. And it's good to hear that on all of those schools, uh, the GB and the head teacher are supportive of the proposals. Um, I saw Judy's hand go up um, at a at an instant. So Judy, it's all yours. Thank you. And I don't want a boxing match with anybody at all this morning. I'm not feeling up to that. Um, but you said that we won't discuss Hexton in this context, and then Jane immediately discussed Hexton in this context, <laughs> um, which kind of makes it rather difficult not to. And I just have this sense that we're working in silos, we're working in boxes of what we always do because it's what we've always done. And I just wonder if there's not something more imaginative um, we could be looking at in terms of Hexton and Purton, which doesn't just separate them out and say this one's going to close and that one's going to get bigger, but actually looks at something exciting and imaginative and linked and joint provision and a bigger school, but set in different settings. I mean, is this really beyond the wit of person? Okay. Can, I, can I just make a point, Judy? Um, I'm not saying that this has uh, preempted the, the situation, but of course, uh, Purton and Hexton did share a head teacher. Um, and that, if you like, to some extent, um, picks up what you were saying about, if you like, or it, it wasn't, but something like a very soft federation. But um, the head teacher felt it was appropriate to to return full time to Purton, um, and so that that left Hexton a little bit separated. Um, yeah, but, but that's not the end of history, is it? No, no, it's not the end of history. And I, 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 I have been um, at both the Purton and the Wareside meetings this week, um, and I have stressed that uh, to both of them um, that this is part of the consultation process. No decisions have been made, but it is part of the consultation process, and there is a recommendation. But that is not a decision. That's the first point to make. And I, I keep stressing that. The other thing also um, to say is uh, that, that it, it's, it's no, nobody wants to see a school closed, obviously, um, but there are, there are some challenges, particularly at Hexton in terms of pupil numbers. Of um, but, but, but that's, 
let, let's let's focus, if we may, because you you've sort of slid me into making a comment. Um, but let's try and focus on the Purton number because that's what it is. And the the point I was going to make is that it would be irresponsible of us not to have in place a situation that protects the children if it were to come to pass that Hexton were to close. And indeed, to some extent, it could be a benefit to people who live in Hexton, even if Hexton were to stay open, that they could have equal parity with um, the children in Purton, or as near as damn it, equal parity. But on the other hand, that might actually work against Hexton, because pe people may say, oh, we'll use that equal parity or near equal parity to go to Purton. It's a really difficult one. It's but, the it's the preemption of it that's that's but I am not to my feet. I am not preempting anything. I'm absolutely no, I'm not. I'm not preempting anything. All right. If and in fact, so. and, and in fact, Judy, I can take you back to two thousand and about 2003, I think it was, when there was the proposal uh, to close Pixies Hill School in Hemel Hempstead. Um, and that was part of, and that went to consultation and so on. And at the end of the consultation and the end of the process, it was agreed that Pixies Hill would remain open. And it does to this day. That's good to know, but I can also take you back to the early 1980s when David Billing was the county councillor for the Hexton, Holwell, Purton patch, believe it or not, um, a Labour rural county councillor. There you go. Um, and so we have lived with these discussions for a long time. Indeed. And I'm have. not moaning. I'm just saying we have. No. No, I and I accept everything that you say, and 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 I accepted everything that was said at the two meetings because they were said in an in an absolute heartfelt way. Totally, totally. Um, I'm 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 sorry. I've 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 forgive me everybody because Judy and I got into a, a, a what might be regarded as a conversation. So I apologise if I've excluded anybody, but I think I saw Lawrence's hand. Next, so I will come to Lawrence if I may. Then I will go to Paula, Michael Muir, and Mark Watkin. We'll see how we get on from there. Lawrence. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, my first question is to it's on the same issue of person. Uh, could could somebody tell me what the actual distance is between Perton and Hexton in terms of um, mileage? and whether there is a bus route which serves both properties. That's my first question. And the second question is really more to you, Chairman, is I know we don't want to discuss Hexton today through the back door, so to speak, but we keep hearing about a consultation. I'm not clear what the definition of consultation is. What is actually happening at the moment? How is this consultation materialising and how is it being manifested? Because uh, that's a very important question that I think we need to have the answer to. Well, I'll take, I'll take the second one. Uh, the consultation is open to people to express their views for or against or in an, another way um, with regard to the proposal. And the proposal is that Hexton School should close in uh, July, August 2022. That that is the con that is what people are being consulted on. At the end of the consultation period, all the information will be gathered together and will be faithfully reproduced. Not necessarily individually, because there'll be a number of comments which will be the same, but they will all be reported, and then they will come back to this panel for a further decision to go to cabinet to embark on the statutory process of closing the school that which, is where which we are, people with... are being consulted terry sorry which people are being consulted well primarily i would say that the people who live in hexton but but anybody with a realistic connection to hexton or purton i mean we're not we're not looking to have to accept um uh, uh consultation responses from 
people in Australia who might have lived in Perton 50 years ago. And I'm, I'm not being flippant about that. I understand. So they're getting letters saying, dear local resident, would you like to reach a view? I believe they are. Um, Jane or uh, Kate can answer that. Would you like me to um, yes. chair? Uh, yeah, in terms of our public consultation, yes, absolutely. Um, all uh, parents, governors, staff will have directly received a letter as well as local residents, uh, but also all county councillors, district councillors, um, the MP. So it's a, it's a wide ranging consultation. It's also available on the Hertfordshire County Council website. So that's obviously publicly available um, to anyone who has an interest and people will be signposted there. But um, as, as Terry indicated, there have also been two public meetings held this week in order that people are able to directly uh, engage and ask questions on the consultation and also the proposal. Um, and that was attended by officers from our team, also admissions, um, and Terry I, I went, went along as, uh, to chair the meeting. So I hope that gives you some clarity and the timetable moving forward where this will come back, I think on the 7th of December, where you'll be able to hear the outcome of uh, the views expressed throughout the consultation. And the consultation period is open until the 3rd of November and the and the website address is www.hertfordshire.gov.uk forward slash consultations. Thank you. Could, could I have an answer to my geographic question now? Jane? Yes, that's Absolutely. Uh, depending on where you live in Hexton, obviously it's a rural parish. The distances to Perton are between three and a half and four and a half miles. When it comes to transport, well, you know that is a distance when it comes to when it comes to um, children going to primary school. However, we have already given a guarantee um, that there will be uh, transport provided to any child who is currently at Hexton to either Offley or to Perton Primary School. Free. Yes. Thank you. So that's above above the statutory entitlement. Um, and it's just because of the really Offley and Purton of are, are very similar distances to um to the Hexton community. And we felt that it was appropriate to, to give that um extended offer for children currently at Hexton School. Thank you. Uh where was I going next? Uh Paula, I think. Thank, thank you, Chair. My my question isn't actually about the the school. Do you want to take all the questions regarding that first, or are you happy for me to ask? Um, no, I very yes. much. I will say, um, I'm so glad this has gone out to consultation, and um, I think the real debate will be when we have that result of the consultation coming in. So, okay. my my question was on the oh. uh, plan. Is is that okay for me? Yeah. To yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm just not sure if I should declare an interest because I have been a teacher in Hertfordshire until last year for a long, long time. And Brent, um, I'm not sure if that's relevant and a school governor, but just said it's it. It's very relevant, but you don't have to declare it. OK, right. Um, and my question was about the the PAN numbers um, and especially Hollywell um GMI in Watford, which is quite a big decrease, 60 to 30. And I know there are a lot of other schools around in that area with my other hat on and um, and they don't seem to be decreasing. Is there any reason why particularly Hollywell has? And um, if the numbers do go up, could these numbers then be changed? Thank you. Um, I think it's fair to say that you don't have to uh, consult on increasing a pan you do have to consult on decreasing a pan so right. you you can respond um that much more quickly um if you are increasing a pan so there is that level of flexibility kate kate did you want to confirm or deny what i've just said that uh absolutely confirm what you just said <laughs> um which is why it's in important to us that um, we we have to consult on these reductions at the appropriate time um, and this as, as Jane said in her introduction um, this proposal to reduce the published admission number at Hollywell um, comes as a direct um, conversation with the school and the governing body and in light of the school's own um, uh, pupil numbers uh, coming forward in the coming year but also in recent years and as um, 
that was sort of said in the preamble, it's really important that we protect schools uh, where we can to make sure that they can organise their classes effectively. Um, and in this instance, having a published admission number of 60 is not reflective of the numbers coming into the school. So actually setting it at 30 is much more realistic and means that we think in terms of class organisation moving forward, they'll be able to recruit the right number of staff and also um, have a sustainable budgetary position. So that's that's the reason for Hollywell um, specifically coming forward in this uh, with this proposal. Thank, thank you, Kate. It, it's also worth making the point that um, decreasing a pan is a long and drawn out process. And that's why this is actually not relevant. This will not come to pass until uh, the school year 23-24, because it has to go through all manner of things, including the office of the school ad adjudicator as well. Uh, Michael Muir, sorry to have kept you waiting. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, my question will be at the end of uh, a little statement. Um, if uh, Hexton clo uh, School does close uh, in the future, um, you will probably need an increase of PAN in Perton School. Um, that might need, uh, Hex uh, sorry, Perton School might need an extension. So behind the scenes are, are uh, our officers uh, looking into that uh, uh, extension if it's needed because we can't just leave it to uh, the new intake to Perton then find out that there's not enough school classes. So are we working behind the scenes that if Perton, uh, sorry, Hexton School closes that we will be looking at uh, further extensions if needed. I think I, I'll let Kate come in, but I think it's worth making the point that looking at GP registrations, the number of children uh, becoming eligible um, for Hexton Primary School over the next four years is measured in zeros, ones and twos. So um, we're talking about in terms of Hexton children, um, we're talking about minute numbers, very small numbers. But Kate, do you want to add? Before Kate does, just to okay. clarify what you've just said, Terry, um, there's there's seven children currently at Hexton Primary School who live in the parish of Hexton. So they're the children we're talking about and the tiny future numbers that, that Terry has um, has mentioned. Perton at the moment, and when we've looked at allocations historically, could, could accommodate the children in individual year groups coming through the standard allocation process without having to expand. So really, we're talking about the one or two Hexton children displacing other children who were coming into Perton from some distance. So what we're really talking about is Hexton children rather than more distant children coming into Perton. However, if there is pressure on Perton and Kate can probably come back on this because there is some development planned around around Perton, um, the, the school could be, um, I think, expanded for, for that development. Kate, is that right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we, we keep a watching brief on all of these things um, and looking at Perton in terms of its uh, capacity to increase as needed. But I'd reiterate what um, was the statement at the beginning around the actual numbers from, from Hexton um, and the impact we think that will have in the short term. Thank you. Um, right, I've got two hands, I think, left. Uh, Mark Watkin, sorry to have kept you waiting, Mark. Oh, did you did you not want to speak, Mark? No, I I I see one hand, and I'm unfortunately I'm very sorry, but I can't see whose hand it is. Oh, Christopher, Christopher Alley. Okay. Hi. Um, sorry about that. I I didn't realise my name wasn't popping up. Um. This is, uh, go back to Hexen again. Sorry, Terry, to to to, to join in the the Hexen debate. Um, 
I, along with some of the other members of the panel here, um, attended on the 1st of October, I believe, um, their, their, their open day. It was a pleasure to go down there. And I stayed to the end because they had some fantastic cakes and, and, and biscuits I thought I'd take advantage. And um, I was talking to a lot of, a few of the, a few of the parents and some of the staff there, and they raised a concern with me, which, are, which I'm glad um, the admissions team is here. Um, they, they, they said that that nobody could actually apply to Hexton via the, the Hertfordshire website. And they and I was unaware of this um, and 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 they seemed quite taken about this attack. This this, this happened just for transparency. I think I'll I'll ask a question. Is or isn't it true um, um, that 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 Hexton um, that people can actually apply or can't apply to to Hexton uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, as it is? No, I'm afraid that's inaccurate. That actually came up at the meeting on Tuesday um, and I was concerned about that. It wasn't something that we'd heard. I hadn't heard of it personally as a senior manager within emissions and it hadn't been reported up through our teams either. Um, so I actually wanted to, I went and clarified that with the head at Hexton yesterday and she has come back very clearly saying it was a mistake um, and that allegation was incorrect. OK, thank you. Thank you, because I got a few emails of, afterwards no. just chasing me up, but I'll respond to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank if you. if um, parents want to detail what they actually think the issue was, I can probably give some more information. But fundamentally, the head has said it, there's no there's no specific issue. OK, yeah, thank you for that clarification. Thank okay. you. Thank you, thank, um, thank you, Chair. Mark, I see your hand has gone back up again, so do come in, please. Sorry, I was um, distracted by uh, an external matters. Um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. Actually, first of all, um, I think the question about Hollywell by Paul has been answered. I was going to say I'm a bit surprised Hollywell is struggling, but there's a huge, great tower block going up very near to it, um, 23 storeys high, which will no doubt have families in it. So as long as it can be expanded back up to uh, two forms of entry in the future, then that's really my point covered. Um, the other point there was about uh, the Purton recommendation. If um, if we agree to it being extended and Hexton is kept open, um, and uh, you know, let's hope it is, so what happens then? Because Purton doesn't need that extra class if Hexton stays open, am I right? Or is it independently needed to be expanded irrespective of what happens at Purton, uh, at Hexton? If somebody can clarify that, that would be helpful. Because if it is expanded, we don't need it to be. Do we just keep it down at one? At its I, think, I think what we've said is this, there's such a small number of children potentially coming from Hexton. Um, that we wouldn't need to expand this. We would, don't expect to need to expand Purton to, to cater for Hexton children. Kate, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think the, the point around the um, published um, admission number is independent um, of the Hexton proposal and relates specifically to um, expected housing in the town. Um, but as we've uh, been through at this meeting, we do keep an eye on um, places and making sure that we try and make sure we've got a good match to uh, or supply to demand. So, no, it's not because of it, but um, obviously it will help to accommodate any children from Hexton should the proposal go ahead. So can I just get clarification? Sorry, just to, just to the expansion of Purton has got nothing to do with Hexton. It's because there's a demand need in Purton that's driving the expansion. The Hexton question is, is, a, is a separate matter and not really fundamental to the, the reason for Purton being expanded. Correct. I think it's in there for your information uh, that the actual proposal was related to housing development closer to uh, Purton itself. OK, thank you. That is helpful. Uh, I saw Fiona Hill's hand go up. Fiona? And Fiona Guest, can you turn your camera off, please? Fiona Hill? Um, thank you, Jim. And we have slightly moved on, but it was just to clarify that that last question that Chris Alley raised, I actually raised because it had been raised to me prior to our meeting in July. And it is actually quite clear in the minutes that when I asked the question about whether parents could apply still, that the officer came back and said that, yes, they could, even if the consultation was approved. Um, obviously, it was before we'd, we'd voted on it. So that is in the minutes, just to clarify that that situation was always, um, it, it was raised as a concern, which I also had um, and, and raised at that meeting. And, and that was the answer I was given. OK, thank you very much indeed. I think that 
we have concluded that bit of it. So we come to the the final bullet point, Jane. Um, uh, the the final bullet point, which is the just to agree the the published mission numbers. You're you're muted, Jane. I'm on mute. Yes, we have um, whizzed through those um, proposed five reductions um, already. I don't know whether there's any further questions on that. I don't think there are. Uh, anybody got any questions? No. In which case, I'm going to ask you please to vote for, against or abstain on the recommendations as set out in the paper. Um, for, against or abstain, please. Chairman, I'd like to clarify. Basically, I dropped out of the meeting temporarily. My husband was on another conference call. Our broadband wasn't wide enough. Can I still vote on this item? Um, let me just uh, get a, a a definitive statement or a, a guidance from Democratic Services on that. Hi, Terry. No, not if the owners missed uh, most of the debate. Uh, Sorry, sorry, Stephanie. Um, if Fiona's missed most of the debate, she should be able to vote on it. I had most of the debate. I dropped out for about a minute when when I, when I broadband. I, I think, I think, I think from what I'm hearing, that is acceptable. So you can vote. So if you can vote for, against, or, or abstain, please. Thank you. That item has been agreed. Right. Moving on to item five, uh, the Hertfordshire Armed Forces Covenant, the annual report update. Thank you to uh, Jane and to uh, Kate. Very much appreciated. And, and thank you for your input uh, during this morning. Um, and we welcome Ashley Lamprell um, to take us through, through. Just, just introduce the um, Armed Forces Covenant annual report update. Welcome. Great. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Chairman said, I'm Ashley Lamprell, I'm policy officer in the corporate policy team. And Kate Briley and I work on the Armed Forces Covenant together. So thanks for having me uh, to share with you the annual report for the Hertfordshire Armed Forces Covenant Board for 2021. As you may know, the Hertfordshire Armed Forces Covenant Board is chaired by Councillor Terry Doris and brings together business, military organizations, charities, NHS, local authorities, who work in partnership to ensure three main aims. Firstly, that no veteran faces a disadvantage when accessing public services, that the armed forces community is honored and celebrated for the sacrifices they have made, and that the military and civilian communities are well integrated in the county. So hopefully you've had a chance to, uh, to see the report, but just briefly to highlight some things. Um, it outlines the work of the Hertfordshire Armed Forces Covenant Board from October 2020 um, until now. And in addition to highlighting some of the annual events um, that we do, like Armed Forces Day and Remembrance Day, the report highlights the work that's been done this year around the veteran ac veterans' access to health care as part of our fair access to services aim. So in 2020, um, with funding from Hertfordshire Public Health, the Covenant Board commissioned Health Watch Hertfordshire to conduct a survey of veterans on what, if, if any, really barriers existed for them when accessing health care. And the final report of that survey was published in, in March of this year, just in March 2021. And sort of from that baseline of evidence, the health subgroup of the Armed Forces Covenant Board uh, developed an action plan, which it's been progressing work on, focusing on four key areas. Um, firstly, to increase the understanding of the Armed Forces Covenant amongst primary care practitioners by promoting the Royal College of GPs veteran-friendly 
GP practice scheme uh, to Hertfordshire surgeries and amongst secondary care practitioners by working with the Veterans Covenant Healthcare Alliance uh, to promote their accreditation scheme called the Veteran Aware, um, and that's to Hertfordshire Trusts. Um, colleagues in the subgroup have also continued to highlight the needs of veterans in the armed forces community within social prescribing work streams, um, is really important. And the work um, also colleagues are doing with the integrated care system to ensure that consistent recording and reporting of issues facing veterans. Um, also had a little in the report um, as part of the board's aim of joining the military and civilian communities. Uh, we successfully, successfully conducted our eighth annual Christmas art competition last year for key stage two pupils in Hertfordshire. And the theme was around paying tribute to really the many things that the military does, uh, which children or people might not initially think about, um, but particularly in, in response to the pandemic. Uh, and on that, we worked closely with Northwood HQ, who created a video to share with schools um, to kind of show those roles. And it really helped bring the competition to life uh, for the children, I think, in a way that we hadn't ever, ever done before. And despite um, the kind of challenges around the pandemic, we actually had the most entries ever received to the competition at around 2000. Um, and we created a virtual slideshow of a selection of the artwork and shared it on social media. And as is tradition, Northwood HQ uh, chose the winners. Um, the commanding officer of Northwood actually last year also did a video at the end of the competition uh, to sort of replace the assembly. We would have normally gone to school and kind of hosted a win winner's assembly, the winning school. Um, obviously, for because of the pandemic, we weren't able to do that. But they recorded a video that the school showed, which um, I think they were quite excited about. This year, county council officers have also been involved in a consultation and engagement process with the MOD uh, regarding some new legislation that's coming into effect in 2022. Um, and the legislation is part of the Armed Forces Bill, which will further incorporate the Armed Forces Covenant into law uh, in that there will be a requirement for specified public bodies to pay due regard to the principles of the Armed Forces Covenant in the area of housing, education and health care. Um, and officers have been contributing uh, views, especially on the accompanying guidance that will, will come out for local authorities. And the final section just lays out some projects going forward into the next year. Uh, one of which is planning for the 10th anniversary this year of the signing of the Covenant in Hertfordshire. And to mark this occasion, we're planning for a reaffirmation ceremony in December, uh, during which organizations will come together again to sort of sign a renewed pledge. And we've also launched the 2021's Christmas art competition, um, which this year will celebrate the Royal British Legion's centenary, their 100 years. So that's just a brief summary of the report, but I'm really happy to take any questions. Uh, Chairman, um, it's fine. Thank, thank you very much indeed, um, Ashley. And and just a couple of thoughts. Um, one from me, I'm very pleased that the Lord Lieutenant joined us for one of our meetings and has actually um, delegated one of his deputy lieutenants who also actually runs a company which has got the Gold Employment Recognition Scheme Award, which is, is great news. And he is a fantastic ambassador um, for the the covenant and indeed for the law uh, for the lieutenancy um i think the other thing also just that i would want to just mention um in in passing is that um graham mcmillan who is the chairman of the hertfordshire ssf afa the soldiers sailors and armed forces Fa families Associ air force association is actually retiring and he has been a huge contributor to the uh, Covenant Board for a number of years and, and also led a training session for a number of uh, districts and boroughs um, in homelessness and housing uh, processes. So um, we, we are incredibly grateful to him for his contribution over the years. We wish him a, a very happy and enjoyable retirement although he's probably been retired for a little while now, but that hasn't ceased to uh, dent his enthusiasm and commitment. Uh, the other thing I think I would also say is an appreciation to the districts and boroughs who have actually um, contributed and, and had either an officer or a elected member joining us for our Covenant Board meetings, which is, is good. It, there was a little bit of a hiatus of a little while ago, um, a couple of years ago, but uh, that has regenerated and it's, it's very good to see. Um, interesting, of course, that we have, uh, you'll have seen 28,000 vets in Hertfordshire. Um, 
and and it's also good to see that the government is increasing the recognition of veterans and the responsibilities that we um, and the wider public sector have for our veterans. And of course, you you only have to be serving for one day to actually become classed as a veteran, which is an interesting uh, fact. I have a couple of hands showing um, Fiona Guest to start off, please. Chairman, that's a legacy hand, so I'll take that down. OK. Um, who else do I see? I don't see actually. Yep, right. OK. Mark Watkin, welcome again. This is a veteran's hand. Let's go back to a legacy hand. I thought you'd like to call it. <laughs> Not a technical term you've just used. Um, first of all, I just want to say congratulations. I have to say to you, Terry, and, and, and Ashley and her team for the incredible breadth of, of support you're giving this veteran community. I must say, I read it and it's an area I know very little about and I have to say I was very impressed. And I just wanted to touch on two issues which get a lot of national publicity and rightly so. One is the struggle that are veterans coming back from Afghanistan or whatever to adjust to life in, in this country back in, you know, and it shows itself in levels of homelessness and levels of mental health. Uh, the harm that they've suffered from having to experience what they've been through. Um, and I just wanted to know, uh, you know, feedback from Ashley as to how significant an issue that is in Hertfordshire and indeed, you know, what issues are what's been taken to, to address those issues. Ashley? Ashley? Yes, thank you. So, um, yes, I know that the um, there's kind of two specialty um, uh, health care or mental health provisions um, that are for the armed forces community. And one is called Op Courage. Um, and the NHS, I know, has been continuing to promote and, and we have as well on Hertfordshire County Council social media channels um, promoting the Op, Op Courage mental health um, service that is available especially after the, the withdrawal from, from Afghanistan. As we know, um, there's been an, in, an increase um, in need, perhaps. And also, I, I believe that there's been some um, additional funding um, announced from the government as well. I think it's 2.7 million. I've yet to see exactly how that's going to be spent. Um, but it's, I think it's it's designed to help with the kind of the the, in, the increase. And um, in terms of homelessness, I don't actually have figures um, to hand for Hertfordshire. Um, but we continue to promote something called the Veterans Gateway um, and other organizations within Hertfordshire on Hearts Directory. So, um, People who are in are in need of support are able to go to those websites um, and and find out exactly exactly where they can go to to have help. There's plenty of organisations within Hertfordshire, uh, the BCS, and of course within the council that that can help with that. If I may, Terry, can I just come back in answer to Ashley, if, if that's possible? Yes, um, Ashley, I, I appreciate you've got a load of stuff to do, but I would think it'd be very helpful for this panel to know more about the state of homelessness of veterans in the county. And I know that's probably a question of going to the districts, but I think it's important that we do get a measure of that. And mm. to a certain extent, the same with the first point about uh, the mental health situation. If we can get some clarity as to just what the numbers are like and you know, is it a, you know, well, I think I've made the point, but if we can get something in numerical terms about yeah. the scale of that challenge, I find that very helpful. Thank actually, you. is that realistically possible? Well, I, yeah, yes. The, um, we recently agreed at a, at a board meeting um, in terms of the kind of structure of the board going forward to set up some additional subgroups. So the health subgroup is functioning really well and making a lot of progress. And in light of the new legislation that's coming in in the next year, um, the board sort of agreed to set up and uh, to look at setting up um, one for one for housing um, as well. So I think that we will be more work underway and we're likely to know more about that, as you say. Um, I do know it's coming out from the district's champions. Um, for example, I know Councillor Hayes in Welland Hatfield has been really successful in encourage, encouraging the council housing department uh, to modify its practice to ensure a service leader and his family were not disadvantaged. Uh, in their application to social housing because of um, his military service. And this actually helped another service lever as well. So we are hearing those stories, but I think this this setting up of a, an additional subgroup or having a specific lead um, will help us to know more about the situation in the county going forward. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Chris Lloyd. 
Th thank, thank you, Chairman, and thank you for two of your points before I ask the question. Thank you for commenting that there were 28,000 veterans currently in Hertfordshire, and thank you also for commenting on the work that the districts are doing, because it's, it's obviously something we're working on together. So my questions, which are for you, Ashley, and you on some of them, if you say I haven't got the information, I'm quite happy to accept that. But of the 28,000, do we have a split by district? My second question is how many current and obviously the numbers change because people move in and out of the county. Uh, do we have working in Hertfordshire? And that then relates to my final point, which is on education because obviously people come into, for example, the NATO base, but they may only be there for 18 months, two years, or three years maximum. This is obviously very challenging for the children who come in mainly, I think, to the school in Councillor Alley's area, which would be Eastbury Farm. But it, it is a real challenge, having in the past spoken to head teachers at that school, and will there be something in the legislation coming forward asking us to try and liaise with education authorities where they move or come from so that these children aren't disadvantaged in their education because of their parents' occupation? Thank you. Uh, I, I do know that um, for, I hope I'm right in saying that pupil premium payments for children who are um, part of service families are increased significantly to allow um, additional resources to be made available for those children. But uh, Ashley, do you want to respond to uh, Chris's comments? Yeah, sure. So um, we know the numbers at Northwood HQ, as you say, there's kind of um, moving in and out. Um, so I don't have an, a number in terms of active service personnel within the county as a whole, but in terms of Northwood, our largest um, sort of headquarters, um, I know they have about 15, um, 1,500, and then new NATO staff have joined as well. So I think that adds about um, 400, of which UK MOD personnel is 58, let me know. Um, and you're right. So in, in terms of children coming in and out with the, with those NATO families, we, we hear that they're settling in well, this new intake of NATO staff. Um, we know there's about 388 children of military families attending Hertfordshire schools because they're they apply for that that service pupil premium, um, which is there to help um, help the school with any sort of adjustments they might need to they might need to make or sort of programs that might help help the children with integration um, in schools. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank thank you, thank you very much. That was was excellent and uh, the whole report was so yeah more than happy to support it when we come to note it thank you terry good thank you, thank you. Uh, let me go to judy judy billing yes i um have an overwhelming need to prove that there is such a thing as a stupid question um and so and maybe it's been answered in that last answer about schools but my question really was why specifically this report comes to this panel, is it just because Terry's dual role or is there some more specific reason why um, we would consider this report at education, libraries and localism? Uh, it comes to this panel in the the localism agenda. OK. That, that's the re that's why that's why it comes to here. Um, but but as you know, Judy, I mean, if I, I do try and be re, as flexible as possible. So if, yeah, yeah. If, if you've got a question at this panel now um, that relates to education in the same way that Chris uh, Lloyd just did, yeah. um, no, I'm, yeah. I'm more than happy to accommodate that. No, that's fine. That's fine. I just really did wonder. And then it, it strayed into the education. So I began to understand anyway. Thank you. The, the 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 essence. I mean, the education is a very important element. Um, and I was actually, uh, I couldn't remember um, what the Ofsted inspection result of Eastbury Farm is, um, but I do know that um, over a number of years, it it has coped with the curiosity, shall we say, of young people, of children coming in and out of um, Northwood headquarters, um, and has and has coped, I think, very well. Um, and I, I remember, I think I'm right in saying that Ralph Sangster 
um, a former councillor uh, at the county council, um, was I think a governor of the school, but I, I wouldn't, I can't be sure. Um, but of course, the covenant spans a much wider area yeah, than yeah. just education and just schools. Of course, um, yeah. And ho uh, housing, health. Um, if you like, the other thing as well is that trying and it and I, I confess and it's a frustration that it's the take up has not been great of doctor surgeries who have made it clear that they welcome veterans. Um, there, there has been a slow take up of that. And and I know that some veterans or I believe that some ve veterans don't want to disclose their, the fact that they are a veteran. And I appreciate that and I, I would respect that. But at the same time, I think it's appropriate for doctor surgeries to be welcoming if people are veterans in that context. Okay. But that's why it's that wider, wider span. Okay. Thanks, Terry. Uh, Lawrence, let me. Uh, sorry, Chris Alley and and I. I sorry, Lawrence. I, Chris Alley was just above you in the list. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, your Chairman. Um, as uh, Councillor Lloyd um, point your point, I have uh, airbase uh, northward uh, within my constituency or my 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 division. Very proud to to have it there. Um, I've got just just a few points. Um, I've got quite quite a few act, active members of the military and also reser and reservists as well as um, veterans within my patch. And so and so do many people um, on this panel and and also certain councillors. Um, I've I know many many people per personally have served, and we, we we talk often about the the veterans men men mental health and we should, uh, but we very rarely talk about their families and. They, they are serving families or their veteran families. And I think far more, um, we, we do need to look at them a lot more, particularly the wives or part, your partners and their children. At the front line, line of this is often the schools. Um, so I spoke to the headmistress at um, Eastbury Farm School a few months ago uh, before the summer, and we did talk about this and, and, and she was coping well, but some other schools don't. Um, and I was wondering if there's any provision, not just looking at uh, veterans and their fa your families, but also serving per, your per personnel. Um, particularly since we have 1,500, 2,000 in in Northwood, um, and some other family families whose 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 loved ones may not be serving in Hertfordshire but abroad or other parts of of, of the UK. Um, and I'm sorry if you have written this in your in your fine report and that I missed it. But is are, is any provision being discussed about outreach into that community of serving per your personnel, and yeah, and particularly the wives and and and, and families there. Uh, before I bring Ashley in, just two things to say. One is that Ash, uh, Eastbury Farm is um, the latest Ofsted inspection report is rated as good, which is which is good to know. Um, and also, although Ashley mentioned uh, pretty much 2,000 people working at North headqu Northwood headquarters, which incidentally was the headquarters for the whole of the Afghanistan repatriation elements, um, not everybody there will have a family living with them. So they they may be elsewhere, but I'll stop there and let Ashley come back. Yes, thank you, Terry. Yes, um, the, the covenant covers kind of um, veteran serving personnel and, and their families, because we know that um, obviously children, spouses, um, th those who are bereaved are also affected um, and so may be placed at a disadvantage. So it, it included, they are included in that. And so, for example, I know um, if somebody comes into a job into a job center, for example, this is something that we've been recently speaking with the Department for Work and Pensions, um, our representative who covers Hertfordshire. They ask if that person has ever served in the armed forces, but they're going to they're currently looking at developing what a question for if they're also a spouse, for example. So those things um, are always yeah continue to be raised and and are hoping hope, hoping hopefully coming in um, because yeah people recognize that of course it's it's a whole family unit when somebody's serving of course yeah. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Chris. Lawrence, all yours. Thank you, Chairman. This is perhaps a slightly tenuous link, but I have a particular interest in my division, uh, as well as generally, with the former um, army interpreters who are part of the Afghanistan refugee community. I have some 50 ex 
I call them ex-servicemen because effectively they are. They might not have uh, been part of the British Army, but they were very much part of the s process out in Afghanistan. And I'm very interested in the educational efforts being made to assist them. You don't mention it at all in the report. I'm not expecting you to give an answer now. But is there any time that we on this panel are going to be learning about the steps that have been taken to help the education of the uh, children of the Afghani interpreters in our county? I, I, I think, Lawrence, um, the whole of the Afghan um, arrivals, as I because then they're, they're not refugees, it would be wrong to call them refugees, but um, I, I would like to think of them as Afghan arrivals. Um, uh, and they are the interpreters, they are the, the, the drivers, and they are the people who have worked with our, um, our people over in Afghanistan. Um, that is really being um, masterminded and, and coordinated through the resources panel of Hertfordshire County Council. But what I can say is that I visited um, one of the hotels where the um, where the, the the Afghan arrivals are being um, put up and housed at the present time, pending their um, allocation to a, a, a permanent home. Um, and I was incredibly impressed by the work that's being undertaken by um, teachers who have actually, there was one teacher there who came with her very newborn baby in a papoose um, and said, I just want to come and help um, because she is on currently on maternity leave. There are others uh, from the um, religious community sectors who have uh, come in to, to join as well. And the, the, the level of engagement by the young people there, whether they be primary school or indeed approaching secondary school, was fantastic. And and they were they were learning, they were getting to grips um, with A, the language, which is good, but also they were maintaining their education and possibly some of their education standards when they were over in Afghanistan weren't necessarily at the same level as they are if they'd have been of the same age over here. Um, but but we have worked incredibly hard and all credit to um, colleagues in a number of departments in Hertfordshire without wishing to be in any way complacent um, on the way that we have actually dealt with and worked with these people and to actually hear firsthand um, some of the experiences that they have. They, they, it really does bring you up short. Now, I, if you've had the opportunity to speak to any of them, you will know that as well, Lawrence. Yes, um, well, I've, been, I've been many times, I go many times every week to the two hotels in Bushy, but I, I was really only interested in the educational side yeah. of it, in the sense that um, on my last visit a couple of days ago, one of the interpreters said to me, we've got some very great educational provision for our youngsters and we appreciate the county sending people in, but my wife would like to learn a little bit of English and she's an adult and could you make some provision for her? And I'm just wondering, I, I'm not expecting an answer now, but who do I address these to then, these sort of wider educational issues in terms of our Afghani visitors? Um, I think probably um, Glenda Hardy, I think. But if, if but if you want to, Lawrence, if you send me a note, I will make sure it gets to the right person. That's very helpful. Thank you. More than happy to do that. Um, and 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 yes, I mean, they one of the other things that has been asked, um, not of not of adult um, people, uh, but why aren't we putting children into schools? The reason we're not putting children into schools and we're teaching them in learning hubs in the hotels um, is because we don't know how long they're going to be in those hotels and it would be very disruptive for both them and indeed the school and the other pupils if we were to put them in there. And uh, and as you will know, um, they get, they get um, moved on to a permanent accommodation with almost no notice at all. It can be as little as 24 hours. So it's. It, I think we're doing the right thing and, and, and giving them the education as best we can in the circumstances. Well, just as a, uh, colleagues might be interested to know, I spoke to a, co a, a, a chap um, yesterday who was quite close to me and he said to me, I've been relocated to a place I've never heard of. Do you, I'm told it's very pretty. I said, what's the address? He said, it's called Hebrides. Have you ever heard of it? I said, 
the oh. poor fellow. What a culture shock that's going to be for him from Bushy to Hebrides. But he's off and he's there today. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> there's no answer to that, Lawrence. There isn't, is there? No, My wife went out and no bought a woolly pullover to make sure he wasn't cold. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they, they, they knit their own up there, don't they? Well, they uh, do. Jan, yes. Jan Madden. Uh, thanks, Ty. Um, I, I just wanted to, to roll the clocks back a little bit, if that's OK. Um, I had, um, I was, I grew up in the Royal Air Force and I was very, very proud to have been involved in the Military Covenant 10 years ago when it was, uh, when it first started with Chris Hayward. Um, and I was involved with a, a committee um, and we met quarterly and it was all to do with, if my memory serves me right, we were looking at um, the disproportionate number of military veterans in our prisons um, and putting them at the forefront for all sorts of things. But this this committee was quite huge. It involved, um, there were only two or three of two or three councillors on it. We had um, doctors on it. We had um, people from um, Northwood on it. I think we had people from RF Holton on it, actually. We had um, people from uh, the Mount Prison on it. Um, is that is that committee still very active? And if so, is there um, any possibility of me getting involved again? Because this is this area of this military covenant is something that I'm really very passionate about. Ashley, do you know that? I don't. It's before before my time, but I'm happy to speak with colleagues who work in the prisons. Um, we on the board. There's a colleague from Project Nova. You might know. I know they do a lot of work in prisons. Um, John Phillips. I'm happy to in investigate. Um, and, and and email you about it if that's if that's appropriate. Um, but no, I'm not. I'm not aware of it. I'm afraid at the moment. No. no. Okay. But uh, Ashley, if you if you do find something out, if you could drop Jan a line. Thank you. Okay. Of course, thank you. I think that we have uh, concluded everybody who, who wanted to participate. So um, the panel is invited to note the contents of the update report. So if I could ask you to again type for, against, etc. That has been agreed. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're approaching 12 noon. We have one more item on the agenda, um, but I think it's appropriate for us to just take a, um, a 10 minute or in fact, um, yes, just about a 10 minute um, comfort break. So it's uh, four minutes to noon, three minutes to noon. So let's reconvene at five past 12, please.
Thank you very much, everybody. We are now back and uh, the meeting is live once again. So we come to item six, the review of the library service post COVID-19. I should, um, in absolute transparency, remind everybody that you will, I believe, have received a an email letter from Alex Tate, the chairman of the Libraries for Life board, um, where he sets out his position with regard to this particular item. Um, I think I, what I would say in introduction is that three and a half years ago, in April 2018, uh, we set in train a process um, for uh, the um, change of libraries into a public service mutual. And I do recall very clearly um, sitting in the council chamber when we discussed this and, and some level of reluctance or reticence at that time to the thought of Hertfordshire County Council or Hertfordshire um, County Council losing its treasured possession of the library service. Three and a half years is a long time, a very long time. And goodness me, how things have changed over that time in, in those three and a half years. And indeed, in the last 18, 21 months. Um, and we are in a very different world and a very different place to that which we were um, in February, March of 2020. And, uh, so, and that change has affected all of us um, in, in a whole variety of ways. And it's given us an opportunity to, to pause and think going forward, is this the right step for us to take? Given the challenges that we have, given the still level of uncertainties that exists around the country and indeed around the world. Um, and are we doing the right thing? And it's on that basis that I would be proposing, if I'm allowed to in that context, that we do note and agree to recommend to Cabinet the recommendation as set out in the in the paper. And that is to cease the transfer of the libraries, Hertfordshire Library Service to Libraries for Life and, and for them to remain in house. Um, there's a lot that we've learnt over the last 18 months, 21 months. We, I'm, I'm so sorry, I've seen a, a curious note come up. Um, a lot we've learnt over the last 18 to 21 months, and there's a lot that we can incorporate into that going forward. And as, as part of that, there is a clear intention, proposal, commitment whichever word you want to use, to create the new libraries strategy, inspiring library strategy for the next 10 years, but starting as soon as we possibly can, certainly starting it in uh, 2022 with the work on that basis. Libraries have changed, libraries, people's use of libraries has changed. And I think that we, are in a great position and our libraries are in a great position to recognise the future. And I think that they will be best served by staying within the Hertfordshire County Council family. Uh, that's that's my initial feelings. Um, I, I'm obviously very keen to hear everybody else's comments. Um, Mark Watkin has, I think, put his hand up, but I think he's also I'm not quite sure we'll come to that in in a in a while, um, we have a number of officers who are with us today, um, but I'm going to start to introduce the paper uh, by moving to the assistant director, Taryn Pearson Rose. Uh, sorry, uh, Taryn, just bear with me a moment, yeah. Mark. You you well, got your hand up very early. It is. It is just a, a material point, and that is to say, for the record, Chairman, that uh, Chris Lloyd and I had a briefing from uh, three directors of the uh, Libraries for Life yesterday afternoon. I think we ought to declare it. I don't know if it's material or not, but uh, we arranged to have a, uh, an online briefing with them, and it has helped educate us in, in, in what we're going to be saying at the meeting. But I think it's important to put it on record. 
OK, uh, on, on the basis of transparency, um, uh, perhaps just for clarity, I have not engaged in any way with um, Libraries for Life. Have any of the other members of this panel um, engaged since the papers were published with uh, representatives of life? I don't want to know what was said, but just for transparency. No. Judy? No, I haven't. OK, thank you. Right, on that basis, nobody else is indicating. So let me now go to Taryn. Yeah. Thanks very much, Chairman, um, and good afternoon, members. Um, so first of all, I just want to apologise for the length of um, the report. It is quite a complex situation. And, and, and in writing the report, one of the things that we were most aware of is that not everyone, not all members have actually been on with us on this journey with libraries because it has been over a number of years. So we felt it was important to include all the context and detail as much as possible to ensure that you have that. However, um, I'm only I'm going to look um, and share the most salient points from my perspective, but of course, very happy uh, to respond to questions on the whole. Um, and uh, and um, as already mentioned uh, by the chairman, um, I have several colleagues with me who should be able to answer or respond to some of the more technical elements. Um, so, um, as, as already mentioned, COVID has had a massive impact on the library service, um, as it has on many, many of the county council services. Um, never before have we seen all library buildings close um, it, within sort of, you know, 12 hours and completely cease all physical services for over four months. Um, the service needed to um, constantly um, adapt to differing uh, restrictions and develop new services to support our customers where they were able to. And I'm very proud of how our staff consistently focused on the customer throughout the whole of the pandemic, despite very challenging circumstances that they had to deal with. Whilst the service is now well on the road to recovery, which is all credit again to our great management team and library staff and volunteers, um, it is still a long way from pre-pandemic levels of performance. And there are um, so there is more information in the report around this, but just to give you an example um, uh, of visits to our library buildings, they were 45% of the equivalent pre-pandemic levels at the end of uh, July uh, 2021. Um, another, again, you know, hugely successful, given um, the journey we've been on over the last uh, couple of years, is our summer reading challenge. We had 13,000 children sign up this year and participate, which is great uh, considering uh, where we were last year. But in 2019, it was 21,000 children that participated. Um, income as well is a, a significant um, element of the library service budget, uh, just, just under a tenth of the budget is from income. Um, and income has been massively impacted uh, by the pandemic. Um, so again, just to give you a feel, the income from fees and charges from April to July this year was £86,000, which is a significant uh, improvement on the same period um, last year, but only 36% of the same period in 1920 and pre-pandemic. I think the other key thing to mention is residents use of the library service has been uh, greatly disrupted and some of this has been quite positive. We've seen lots of things go online. We already had um, a really positive direction of travel in terms of our digital services and the pandemic shifted more people onto using ebooks, audio books, our, our virtual library and we saw some fantastic um, digital events online. Um, but what we don't know as yet is, is, is whether uh, residents will go back to their usage and their patterns of usage um, uh, of pre-pandemic levels and, and or whether there will be a much longer term shift. So the Inspiring Library strategy, which is the 10 year strategy uh, that we launched in 2014, has been hugely successful for the service. Um, we've seen significant investment um, uh, in our buildings. Uh, about half the estate has either been renewed, refurbished, relocated um, over the last decade. 
um, significant investment in technology as well. Um, and we've seen our visits to libraries top the six million uh, level, which has been unseen for at least 15 years. So really, really positive direction of travel. But I think what 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 that strategy was relevant for uh, pre pandemic. And I think what we need to look at is the sort of impact that the pandemic has had either directly or indirectly on the library service and start to develop a new strategy, which is fit for post pandemic Hertfordshire, critical for setting a clear direction for the future guiding that um, sort of evolution and development of the service and reconnecting and supporting our residents and communities. And this strategy needs to be very much about building on the successes of inspiring libraries, um, but making sure that the library service is both fit for purpose and actively contributing and centre of delivering excellent local services in a post pandemic communities. Um, so importantly for this paper, um, the, the recommendation in this paper, um, what we are likely to see is a new strategy set out an ambition which is quite different to what we actually set out in that procurement exercise in 2019. Moving on, in section seven of the report, um, we've outlined um, in some detail um, the uh, information on uh, the transfer of the service to libraries for life. But just for brevity, in 2017, the council commenced work to look at the feasibility of alternative delivery models. Um, and the potential option that these uh, models might have both in making savings for the council, but also drawing in other benefits for the library service. And Libraries for Life as a public service uh, mutual with charitable stated, status was established by the council after cabinet endorsing uh, the business case in 2018. The library staff and managers uh, led a successful tender um, through the procurement exercise on behalf of Libraries for Life. Um, and the uh, public sector mutual does now have a, a board of trustees um, who have been patiently waiting for the service to be transferred. We did agree with the board of trustees back in March um, 2020 that due, due to COVID, we would need to postpone the transfer date. So currently, um, as mentioned um, already, we have not recovered to such an extent that we can transfer the service. The contractual specification levels cannot be met uh, based on the current delivery to date. Um, and there is some significant recovery that would still need to occur before we would be able to do that. And I think there is even a question mark about whether we will ever get back to those 2019 levels in quite the same way, and therefore whether we, we can transfer the contract at any point in time. Um, it's, it's very important to note, and, and this is more ex, uh, fully explained in the legal implications in Section 9, that the Council is unable to make material amendments to the contract and the specification at this stage. Um, in essence, we are still within that kind of original procurement process, and then we're not able to negotiate or make any uh, material changes to the contract uh, with Libraries for Life. Even when um, we, uh, if, if we did get to the point where we uh, were able to meet those contractual obligations, then there would still be an, uh, a number of tasks that need to be implemented and that these are set out in section 7.8, so I won't go um, through them all. But unfortunately, due to the amount of time that has elapsed, it's not a case of just simply resuming where we sort of stopped, as it were, and finalising the last few um, actions. Due to the amount of time, many of the critical tasks need to be completely repeated. And I'll just give you one example. Um, so there, we, ha we had to complete 47 condition surveys um, as part of the leases, um, and they were completed back in 2019. Those condition surveys are only valid for 18 months, so would need to be uh, redone. Um, there are a, a range of risks with any implementation process, and many of these risks are different to 2019, uh, 20, and have a risk of uh, costs escalating further or even um, uh, issues jeopardising the transfer. 
Um, we have set out in the paper um, in the financial implications um, the, the amount of money that we have spent um, on this process. So the total forecasted cost of setting up a public service mutual, the procurement, the implementation was just over £543,000. The actual spend to date, and please remember, we were two weeks off transferring the service, so we had done all, all of that work. And the actual spend to date is um, around £459,000. And it's in anticipated that should we move forward with the transfer at whatever point we are able to do that, that we would need to spend a further £200,000 to £300,000 to complete that. Clearly, there is a consequence of not transferring the service in terms of the savings of um, £500,000. Um, and um, in discussion uh, around this with colleagues, this amount would not fall directly on the library service to find in a different way, though I'm sure any efficiencies or opportunities that come out of writing a new strategy will be looked at. But the 500000 will be added to the overall council's position to be looked at in terms of overall budgeting. Ultimately, we, we find our position, ourselves in a position now where if we were to continue with our current direction of travel, we could find ourselves um, potentially looking to complete an implementation and transfer of the service, possibly in the next few years, but we don't know when, where we would be contracting a service based on 2019 specifications for a further five years. And in essence, tying the hands of the service and of Libraries for Life, if, if, if we progressed, to allow that service to evolve and to develop and to respond to the post-COVID landscape. So that is why we have um, uh, uh, made these two recommendations um, to cease the transfer to, of the Hertfordshire Library Service to Libraries for Life and to keep the library service in house with the council um, at this time and to commence a new uh, library service strategy um, to ensure that the service is best placed to thrive and support Hertfordshire residents and communities over the next 10 years. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Taryn. I think uh, there's a couple of things that I just pick up from what you've just said, um, which was, and you made the point that we were due to go to uh, uh, the transfer of the library service with only a matter of a few weeks before pandemic struck. Um, and we delayed that for obvious reasons, because it would have been wholly unfair to have handed to a, a fledgling new organisation, albeit with a number of our senior management team, um, a situation where, frankly, all the libraries were closed. There was no income. There was no revenue other than the, the, the funding that is the natural funding from Hertfordshire County Council. And, and I think it was entirely right that we should have paused it at that time. I think now, the one thing that the library service is looking for, the one thing that Hertfordshire residents are looking for, is certainty. And I think that by making this decision today, which I hope will be supported by everybody, that will give certainty that the library service is going to stay in Hertfordshire County Council, is going to thrive. It's going to be lively and agile for the future and it's going to be the benefit to all our residents. And you, I could list you all the, the works that have taken place over the years. I won't because you'll probably know of them. But just to pick up two items in particular, or one item in particular, is the, the and it's not going to be applicable to every library, but the Open Plus service, which we've adopted, where we've actually extended the opening hours of only a couple of libraries, because at the present time, they're the only ones that we can physically do this at. But it's something that as we build new libraries or we refurbish significantly libraries, we can look at doing this. But it does actually open the library's doors to people for a larger number of hours during the week without needing to have staff there. But it maintains the library facility and the library provision for those people who want to use it outside, shall we say, the core hours of nine or 10 till five. So 
I, I see a number of hands. I'm going to stop. As Taryn has said, um, we welcome Scott Crudgington, our Director of Finance, um, and we have other officers who are prepared and able to respond to specific topics, if you wish. Um, this is an important decision, so I, I do want to give everybody the opportunity, and I'm going to start with Mark Watkin. Uh, thank you very much, Kerry. And uh, yes, I think it was absolutely the right decision to defer the transfer at the point that you'd made that decision. I think that was absolutely right. Um, and uh, I just want to be absolutely clear. I, I think uh, Taryn's briefing to us has made it uh, fairly clear that, that essentially the idea of setting up a mutual separated library service is now history and will not be revived, at least not in the foreseeable future. We can't predict obviously forever, but it's not the way that you're going to go forward. And I want that stressed, I think, because I think the staff need to have absolute certainty about where they stand. They must have gone through quite a journey of uh, wondering whether they were going to be employed by a new company or new new trust or whatever. So I think a very strong statement to the to the world is, is essential. Um, the you, Taryn has referred to the costs of the operation to date, and I think she said it was five. Well, no, I know she said it's five hundred and forty-three thousand because it's in the report. Um, it's quite interesting when we were originally being uh, asked to expect that this would save five hundred thousand because of business rates uh, reduction. Um, so it does. It's a question, I think, for Scott. Um, far from saving five hundred thousand, Scott. I mean, the five hundred forty-three obviously was in in the budget or thereabouts because it wouldn't have gone there without it. But you now have an interesting challenge, which is where do you find this five hundred thousand? And I'm asking again for a commitment that was in, implied there, Terry, that you will not be coming back to the library service to find it in another way by, for example, closing libraries or reducing staffing levels or whatever to achieve something similar, but in a different approach. Um, turning to the actual uh, mutual, um, I do think that they've been treated rather brutally. And I, I make the point because they have been in uh, waiting in the in the wings um, and developing their own strategies. They've even employed a chief executive to take control of the service they thought they were going to be operating. And they only discovered that the whole plan had been completely put into the back burner, without, not in back burner, completely cancelled um, about the same day that the paper was issued to us as county councillors. I'm I'm frankly a bit surprised by that. Um, I, you know, one would have hoped that there would have been a continuing developing relationship, which would have ended up with the explanation that they almost didn't need that, look, guys, the world has changed. It's got beyond what we originally specified to you. And, uh, you know, now we really can't go ahead with what you've bid for and we put out to you. So to leave it like that, when they've got everybody effectively waiting to go, um, seemed to me to be, um, well, it could have been handled better. I think I'm going to put it no stronger than that, but I know they feel very wounded that they were not given a chance to sort of at least be involved in, in the continuing situation. Um, I think those are really the care points. Oh, so the last one is looking to the future. Um, reference has been made to the opportunities that now having complete control, or continuing to have complete control of libraries are going to give us. There's reference to co-location of services and whatever. Um, I think what I'm really looking for is at some point in the next, say, year, some sort of clarity as to exactly where the Libraries for Life strategy will go in practical terms. What will this now mean in terms of developing the service? Um, Taryn has done a great job at spelling out opportunity. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing this being delivered into some sort of, this is a list of exactly what we will do um, to show that there is energy behind this decision. And it's not purely a defensive position. It's a, it's a chance to actually build on what I absolutely accept has been success in many ways over the last few years. But we've gone from a period of limbo and a back step. I want to see us now moving ahead productively. I know it's a bit of a ramble, but I think there's some points in there that need answering. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, you will have heard me say on 
many, many occasions, every challenge is an opportunity. And I think that I would see that in this particular context. And we do have an opportunity in, with regard to your, your, if you like, your challenge um, about what's going to happen going forward. That's the whole purpose of developing a new library strategy, that we are developing a library strategy and bringing it forward, I should say, by a couple of years, instead of starting in 2024, to start the work in 2022, so that we are alert and alive to it. Um, that's the first point I would make. The second point um, with regard, Mark, to your comment about Libraries for Life employing a, um, a chief executive, I have to say, to the best of my knowledge, that decision was made entirely by Libraries for Life. It wasn't a decision made by Hertfordshire County Council or indeed with the um, agreement of Hertfordshire County Council, I have to say. Um, with regard to the involvement of Libraries for Life, which you have mentioned after Scott, I'm going to ask John Oakley, who is one of our uh, commercial lawyers in Hertfordshire County Council, to make a comment on the legalities of that, because there are some issues about that and to explain to you, Mark, the reasons behind it. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Scott um, for the financial aspect, if I may. Of course, uh, yeah, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, Councillor Watkin, for, uh, for the question. So, Look, the um, I think the, sort of the, the, the first point I wanted to make is is that we we absolutely recognise the uh, the difficulties uh, for the uh, for the trustees and the board in in working through um, this uh, this decision. And I, I do want to put, make sure for clarity that uh, we made made it clear to the chairman on a private briefing on the run up to uh, in advance of this report coming uh, public um, in terms of where our proposed recommendation was going to be. Um, and also in advance of that, we made clear that there was an options paper being presented and that that was a while back that we made clear to the board that that was in development. So um, so I just, just wanted to put, put, put that on record in terms of uh, notif notifications that we gave to, to the trustees. As far as the savings are concerned, um, that uh, I also need to make clear that we, we, we as part of this decision, that we are uh, agreeing that the, the, the savings obviously can't be made as expected within and planned within our integrated plan, but we would not be leaving that target effectively within the arena of libraries, that that now becomes a corporate challenge uh, of which is now being um, in, uh, built in and embedded within our IP uh, development over uh, the coming, uh, the next couple of years. So um, you know, our organisation will respond to that, and, but that doesn't mean that libraries you know, won't be encouraged through the development of their next strategy to look for new areas for income generation, for being able to reduce costs or whatever the case may be. But you know, I do, do want to make it absolutely clear that the five, you know, the 500,000 odd uh, savings target is not going to be um, linked to the library service directly. That is now part of a corporate response that we will now be making across the organisation to add that to our, our gap uh, for, for the next couple of years, which we're in the process of now addressing. Pause there, unless Stephen wishes to add anything to that, Chair. No, no uh, Stephen's shaking his head. Um, John, John Oakley, I think you're with us. Would you like to comment on Mark Watkins' uh, point about the discussions with Libraries for Life? Yeah, uh, th thank you very much, Chairman. Yeah, uh, just again, just by way of introduction, I'm John Oakley and I head up the commercial team at Hertfordshire County Council. In the legal department, I've been involved throughout this process in terms of advising on the, the the legal requirements in terms of this procurement process. And I think it's important to remind everyone that we we run this in accordance with the public contract regs 2015, and we run a, a restricted process. Now, what that means is it, it restricts the amount of um, negotiation, communication you can have with the bidders, including the successful bidder. And therefore, we've been mindful that since pausing that procurement process, we are still within that procurement process, which restricts us in terms of our communication. And therefore, we've had to be very careful in terms of what we have uh, been able to say to Libraries for Life until obviously it became a public document. Um, and as Scott has said, there were communications going on in the background as, as far and in accordance with the legal requirements that we could do. Um, so that has restricted us. So hopefully that answers Mark's point in terms of that. 
Thank you very much indeed, John. Uh, Mark, I'm going to give you the opportunity. Did you want to come back at all on either of those responses? Um, well, thank you for giving me the chance to respond. Um, I mean, I'm not a legal man, and John clearly is. And uh, it, I, I accept what he's saying. I do know they feel bruised. Um, as to the recruitment of a, of a, of a CEO, um, yes, they take that risk. They, they have to stand and fall by it. But I think they took it on the belief that there was going to be a positive outcome for their bid to, to run the library service, um, which goes back to my point about communication. Um, I know Taryn, in which you briefed us, made some reference to a, a, a conversation in June, I think, or July with uh, I think Alex Tate, the chair of the trustees, where she alluded there was review being carried on, but not enough, I think, to stop them from thinking this was a, a technical matter, not a fundamental matter. But uh, I accept what's been said. I, you know, it's what's done is done. But I have put on record that they do feel badly bruised by the way they've been treated, which is a shame because there's some very high quality people sitting at the top of the Libraries for Life service, and it would have been great. And hopefully we can still encourage them to get involved in county matters in another way, because uh, an ex-director of HP, a chairman of uh, Wix, you know, these are people of, of substance that, that would have been valuable if they had been involved in delivering a future strategy. OK, thank you, Mark. Uh, Chris Lloyd. Th thank you very much, Chairman. I'm not going to reiterate the points that Mark has made. I want to try and take us forward because I think the reports and the answers, the briefings, the emails we've had from Libraries of Life have given us the position. We are in a world that has fundamentally changed. But what I'd like to um, there are a couple of things I'd like to ask for, and you may come back and say, yep, they're possible, no, they're not possible, or we need to think about it. So one is, I think, if we're saying, which I think the recommendation is, um, that we're not going to be pursuing with Libraries for Life, then I think there ought to be some form of meeting with them to sort of formally explain and give them the opportunity now we're beyond the legal point john so that they have that information they have that closure we can thank them for the work they have done because if it hadn't been for covid you know they would be running our library service they would be our partners so i think that would be useful because they've obviously invested a lot of their time and energy working with us and obviously you scott and your team and Taryn have also invested a lot of time to try and make it happen uh, but i'd like to go back to what you said terry we've got to take this new opportunity and what i'm for the new strategy. I have been passionate about libraries since I was at university. I was on the university library committee. I was also, if you go back long enough, we used to have panels for our local libraries long <clears throat> before I was a councillor. I was on one of these panels. I set up a book group in, in Croxley Library. So I'd like to encourage you to ensure that all of us, regardless of party, and the fact we're not in the administration, can be included because I think we have a real opportunity for Hertfordshire as a whole. Um, as you say, it's a challenge, and I want to work with you and Mark and Terry and whoever else to ensure that when we look back in five years' time, we can say, yes, we, we are meeting the challenge of the 21st century. We are getting more people reading, whether it's electronically or online. Um, I will give a challenge to the rest of this committee. You know, how many books do you read in a year? rather than just reading your council papers. My aim is to read 60 by the end of this year. It's going to be a struggle. Uh, I have to get up early or go to bed late to fit the time in. But it's really, really important to model for our young people that book reading is important, whether you do it electronically. So thank you, Taryn, for your report. And thank you, Scott, for your work. And thank you, Terry, for what you've been doing. I will be supporting the recommendation. Thank you, Chris, and and I hope that one of your uh, your books on your library list is a book by Judy Billings' daughter as well. Um, I do have to get that little plug in for you. Um, and as a matter of interest, I have a connection with libraries insofar as when I was at school, I was the school librarian and had and was well versed in the Dewey Decimal System, 
Um, I can't remember any of it now, but that's what it was. Uh, but thank you for your comments. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, much appreciated. Um, I'm going to come to Fiona Guest now. Thank you, Chairman. Wearing another hat, I sit on the audit committee where we look at risks and how they can be controlled and mitigated against. In the report for this item, it was highlighted that the financial risk to a transfer to Libraries for Life has greatly increased because of COVID. And in her presentation today, Karen highlighted that the uh, new risks have come up as a result of COVID. So by not progressing the transfer, by keeping the libraries in house, we'll be mitigating against those risks. So I support the keeping them in house for that reason. Thank, thank you, Fiona. And I, I, I omitted to respond directly to Chris's comment um, about meeting. Obviously, the the final decision on this um, is a, a decision for cabinet, um, and it would be subject to call in if 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 needs be. But once that is clear and passed, um, I personally would have no objection to meet with, uh, along with Scott and Taryn, um, to meet with the, the senior members of, of uh, Libraries for Life to express our appreciation for what they have been doing in the background and, and also to, to share with them, if you like, the fact that, as I said right at the very beginning, we're in a different situation now and it's right that we should take these steps to meet those new situations. But having said that, I hope that I've made that clear. And I'm coming to the mother of the author now, Judy Billing. Thank you, Chair. And I was going to try so hard not to refer to the excellent novels that um, my daughter's been writing for some years now, although I do see posters for them behind me um, in my study at home. So thank you for that. What I actually wanted to say was was maybe slightly more briefly than than Mark did, but the same message. I'm part of the County Council Inspiring Libraries generation. Some of those conversations were very difficult. Um, some of the processes were very difficult. Some of the worries about the grading into to different types of library were hard for a lot of us to, to bear and cope with. Um, and, and yet we all worked really hard together to make it happen. I was not a huge enthusiast, like many people, of the idea of, of, of the mutual, but I went with it because I thought at the time it was the only way forward. So I'm not heartbroken at all, but it's not now perceived to be uh, probably the best way forward. And I admire the pragmatism um, that, that we're really all operating with. So my worries, I suppose, like Mark's, are that we still got this magical £500,000 that we were threatened with right at the beginning of Inspired Libraries as something that had to be saved. We are still, after all these years of not closing any libraries, I still terribly fear our going into any realm that that, that, that happens in. Um, and I think we're all going to have to work very hard indeed to make it happen. I don't quite see the business with the mutual board as it's being now portrayed as having been absolutely ready to go from the get go. I mean, I do recall two or three years ago some quite difficult, knotty problems in establishing the, the mechanisms that were going to take this over. So it's not been a simple matter of people sitting there ready and waiting to go. Um, so I don't I don't quite take that. Um, I think it's the right decision. I do support it. I just I suppose my biggest worry about libraries this very day is that we now have Nadine Doris as Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, um, who is saying some extraordinary things about councils closing libraries as if 
the expenditure from government to local government never had anything whatsoever to do with that. So if we can keep Nadine Doris away from Hertfordshire Police, even in any new boundary reviews, I'm sure we can work together to make this the best that we possibly can for the people of Hertfordshire. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, I think one one point I would come back on and 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 just observe. The first thing I think we have to say is that throughout the pandemic, it, it has been hugely stressful um, for our library staff um, who were who were shut out of libraries and then they went into ready reads and so on. But equally and mo and terribly importantly, and we mustn't forget all our volunteers who run our community libraries, who, who do a fantastic job. And, and that comes back to my, my premise, so if you like, about certainty as well. Um, I, I think in terms of the, your final comment, Judy, is we do have to recognise that high streets have changed and the retail um, configuration has changed. And if you think about the Timpson Review, and I, th I forget the name of the, the co-author of that, um, who made reference to the fact that one of the, the, the anchor areas within a high street should actually be a library. Um, and that is something that we have sought to do as much as we possibly can. And a very good example of that is the new Hatfield Library in White Lion Square, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, and attracts a lot of people and it's helped actually to revitalise that particular retail sector of Hatfield and I'm, I'm very proud of that and likewise I could wax lyrical about some of the other libraries that we've done um, such as Redbourne and Wheat Hampstead and Nebworth etc etc um, but but that's that's the points that I would make um, sorry I I, I I've forgotten whether you had a question out of all of that, so apologies. But I think certainty going forward is so important. Um, let me come to Mark Mills Bishop. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, a question, really, I think for John, uh, but it may, may be for Taryn. Uh, let me say I support uh, the recommendations. Uh, uh, from the outset, so there's no problem there. My question is an extension of what Mark, uh, the other Mark, was saying about communication with the board and the trust, and how how uh, 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 how much communication was given. Can I change that word, John or Taryn, to compensation? Are we liable at all for what they may have done or not done? how prepared or not prepared they have been and whether they've employed a chief executive. Is there any comeback to uh, uh, Hearts County Council in relation to not so much communication, we can weather that, but compensation? I, I see John nodding his head. So I'll start with John and then perhaps Scott may want to chip in after that. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, we are um, fully protected. Um, we have run the process and all com communication that has been issued to Libraries for Life um, detailed that this was subject to contract and that we could still uh, reserve our right not to proceed with the procurement. So we've acted in accordance with the requirements of the uh, public contract regs in terms of that. So, no, we should not be subject to any compensation. Good. Thank you. Scott, did you want to... Up. No, nothing more to add. That, that's absolutely fine. We're, we're, I'm more than content that all the safeguards have been put in place, uh, Chair, um, and um, yeah, and, and the decision not to proceed um, is absolutely one that we can take. Okay, okay. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you both. Yeah, uh, Lawrence. My question relates to the Mount Prison, Chairman. Um, I, 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 it might be in the report. It was so long, I, I, I sort of gave up the will to live when I was reading all, all pages of it. Uh, could somebody tell me, is the Mount Prison Library still functional or not? Uh, the Mount Prison Library is our 47th library. It is functioning. Um, I'm not sure whether it's um, uh, in a state of suspended activity at the present time, but Taryn has come in and so I'll defer to her. Um, yes, yeah, so Councillor Burrells, you're absolutely right. Um, um, the uh, Mount Prison would have been part of the service that would have been transferred in part of the procurement exercise. Um, however, it will now stay with us. We have the 
um, uh, the, the duties around making sure that prison library services are delivered as, as, as the relevant um, local authority library service. Um, it is running at the moment. It's slightly adapted and restricted. In actual fact, we had a presentation from our prison librarian the other day talking about the wonderful work that they have been doing and trying to get back to normal uh, within the prison. But there are start, still some restrictions on that service currently in the mount. Because you started off the report by saying it was shut for COVID, but it's been reopened, has it? it I, I believe they are providing services in the wings. I'm, I'm not sure that people, or, or perhaps, uh, would it be better if I came back to you, Lawrence, with a complete update? Because it's quite a rapid uh, moving situation, but we're certainly delivering library services in the mount. Well, it would be helpful. And if I could just ask Chairman, I know this might sound a little bit unusual, but um, I, I've spent a lot of time professionally uh, in and out of prisons, and I know how much the library service in prisons means to the inmates. And if it would be possible uh, for perhaps one day when things are back to normal to have a, a visit by members of the panel to the Mount Prison Library, I think it would be very helpful. We, we, we can certainly ask. I have also visited the Mount Prison and I was hugely impressed and of course the library service works in normal times works in the education wing at the mount um, and is part of the um you uh, the open university i think it is um to allow people to to take degrees if they are uh, so minded um it's certainly something we we can ask if that's possible but i i i can't obviously make any um, commitment on behalf of the Ministry of Justice, but Taryn may be able to. Thank you. Sorry, I've just realised, um, Chairman, that Michelle is actually on the call, so she would be able to answer that question properly rather than me um, coming back with a response. Right, OK, over to Michelle. Michelle is the Acting Head of Library Services. Uh, thank you very much and um, good afternoon, um, members. Um, I apologise in advance. I've actually got a dry cough, which exacerbates, which exacerbates when I talk. So if I suddenly start coughing, um, I'm sorry for that. Um, yes, um, the um, situation at the Mount Prison has um, been somewhat in parallel to the public library service provision because we've also been acting with additional um, restrictions um, because of the uh, the Ministry of Justice. So um, we have been operating for a long time on a wing only service um, and um, the that has meant that some of our services were restricted. Very recently, within recent weeks, we have been able to now start a by appointment um, process for our prisoners. So it depends on which wings they're on and that's within the um, prison administration, but they can now make an appointment to visit the library. We are still absolutely um, maintaining our support for the Open University for those prisoners who are seeking to further their education. And we also have um, continued the Storybook Dads um, service, which enables um, prisoners to stay in contact with their families, which is incredibly important. Um, and in fact, we've managed to secure some funding from the prison for a video camera as well, so that it's not just recordings, it's actually um, video recordings of them reading bedtime stories for their youngest um, members of their family. Um, and there are some other um, developments at the prison. So whilst it's been extremely stressful and difficult for the staff on site. Um, they have um, completely um, put the prisoners and there's library service to the prisoners at the forefront of the recovery um, and are continuing to add services on as well as dealing with the restrictions. OK, Can I say thank you for all that information. That's very valuable. No, you're very welcome. Uh, just interesting. It, it just demonstrates the spread and the uh, the, the activities of the library service in the wider sense. Um, and we've also actually been fortunate to bid for funding from uh, uh, various government departments over, over months and, and years as well. And we've been successful in doing that, which has also added to the capacity of the libraries to deliver additional services. Um, I'm going, I see Fiona Hill with her hand up and I don't see anybody else. So I think probably uh, this will be the last contribution before we go to a vote. So, Fiona. Thank you. 
I wasn't on the panel when the initial decision was made prior to the pandemic, and I have questioned the funds already spent, which obviously has been raised previous by previous speakers as well. But I don't believe that that on its own is a reason to continue as things have changed. And if we don't feel it's the right way forward, in my view, the recommendations in the report today are correct and it would be the correct decision to um, go with them. And I fully support the recommendations in the report and the new decision. Thank you very much indeed, Fiona. As I say, I see no further hands. Um, Taryn, did you want to make any final comment at all? Or, or are you content that we just go um, that? I, I don't think I have anything to add. Um, I hope that uh, colleagues will support the recommendation as set out. Um, but did you want to make any other comment? I, I suppose, Terry, if I may, just um, a, a couple of comments that have come out of the questions have, have been more about how we engage with members more broadly um, and engage in developing that strategy and work together. And I think we've had some very, very supportive comments from, from members, which is really, really helpful. And one of the things that I was most proud about the service when we did the original Inspiring Library strategy is we engaged with over 15,000 people, either through focus groups or surveys or sort of um, more general engagement events. So, uh, you know, I would expect us to very much co-produce and engage very much on this strategy moving forward because we don't, as officers, have all the answers, hence the fact that we need to do this strategy to look at how do we ensure libraries are at their very peak moving forward. So I really welcome those comments and just wanted to thank everyone for them. Thanks very much, Chairman. Thank you, Taryn. So I'm, I am actually going to read the recommendations so that there is no uh, ambiguity or confusion, and that is that the panel recommends to Cabinet that it agrees to cease the transfer of Hertfordshire Library Service to Libraries for Life and for the Library Service to remain in-house with Hertfordshire County Council at this time, and to commence the development of a new Library Service strategy in 2022-23 to ensure the service is best placed to thrive and support Hertfordshire residents and communities over the next 10 years. So can I ask you to vote please for, against or abstain? Just waiting for Democratic Services to confirm the vote. Thank you, Stephanie. Can I just check, Stephanie, did everybody vote? Yes, everyone apart from Jan, but I've checked and she's not in the meeting. Oh, right. OK. All right. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you uh, to our officers for their contributions. They are very much appreciated. So thank you. Um, that there is no other part one business. Um, the date of the next uh, panel meeting is the 7th of December. Thank you all very much indeed for your attendance. Thank you very much for your contributions. Um, it's been a long meeting, but I think um, one in which we have discussed a great deal of things, and I appreciate that, and I thank you. So on that basis, good afternoon. Thanks, Terry.